Днешният гост е Елият Уайс. Елият е предприемач от Великобритания, който се преместил съвсем наскоро с част от своите бизнеси в България, тъй като смята, че тук има по-добри възможности за развитие. Историята на Елият е по-интересна, тъй като то от хората, които не бягат на запад и не си остават на запад, а всъщност идват в България, тъй като тук той има достъп до по-добър и по-гладен талант, вижда някакви възможности в нашата държава. Като в днешния разговор си говорихме за неговият предприемачески опит, как той е стартирал на 13 години с първата си веб дизайн агенция съвсем случайно. След това всички други бизнеси, които е развил, говорихме си за взаимоотношенията с него и неговата съпруга, как управляват двамата съвместно своите бизнеси, без това да пречи на техния съвместен живот и на живота на децата им, уроци за лидерство, как да си избираме партньори и дали да действаме с партньори, как да наемем хора, как да реагираме в различни бизнес ситуации и какви възможности има за развитие на бизнес, както в България, така и извън нея. Днешният епизод е записан на английски язик, като сме се подсигурили да има субтитри, така че не забравяйте да си включите субтитрите под това видео или разбира се, ако английският а, 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 ви харесва и искате да, да слушате епизод на английски, се надявам, че пък а, мод английски а, е достатъчно добър, така че да, да ви е удоволствие да гледате този епизод, като ако искате да видите пък и други предприемачи, които, с които си говорим на английски, тъй като ние имаме широк кръг от предприемачи извън България, може да се включите в нашето Discord общество долу от линка в описанието. Доста често каним експерти от извън България, които да споделят своят международен опит. А сега ви оставам с видеото с Елият Уайс. So welcome Elliot. It's very nice to have you. We've been doing this podcast for 20 uh, 20 minutes now. <laughs> It's always the way. Yeah. That stuff's always caught off camera. Yeah, yeah. We talked uh, about a lot of a lot of cool things and uh, before before we actually came to the podcast, yeah, we had a call because uh, obviously I don't know you. Like I saw a podcast uh, with you and and another guy Sam- Samir. Samir, yeah. Samir, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a really cool guy. He actually hit me up as well. Yeah, he's a legend, to be honest. Yeah, a really cool guy. Uh, and I wasn't sure about you. You know, norm- it's it's only normal. I do have one of those faces. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, um, uh, I, I think I told you that on the call. Like, you, you look like this certain type of guru mm. nowadays that, uh, you know, has the, the, the lavish lifestyle, the cars. And he's like, all talk, but you don't know what's on the back end. And we talked, I saw that you're a really cool, genuine guy. You have a great message, actually, that I, I want to talk, um, talk about today. And uh, we can discuss uh, a lot about the reasons why you decided to move to Bulgaria. Well, some of your stuff, some of your businesses to Bulgaria. And talk about your experience with business life and uh, giving good advice to young men. Because we just finished uh, this page of the convo about young men and how they're uh, a bit impatient, I think, mm-hmm. about uh, progressing. Uh, so yeah, but b- before that, you know, sponsor of this video is Beyond Card. Ако искате да стартирате свое мобилно приложение за вашия онлайн магазин, може да го направите бързо, лесно и удобно с помощта на Beyond Card от Studio Grind. Това също така е апликацията, която ние ползахме за да създадем приложението на Proof Nutrition, от което нашите клиенти могат да си поръчат бързо, лесно и удобно любимите си добавки. Ето и кои са предимствата на Beyond Card. Първо, това е софтуер за сервис приложения и само с един плагин можете в рамките на една седмица да публикувате вашето приложение. Това спастява много време и усилия от разработка на специализирано приложение специално за вашият магазин. Нещо, което забелязахме ние, но знаем и от Beyond Card, е, че когато хората ползват мобилната апликация, средната стоеност на количката е средно с 10-15% по-голяма, поне при нас, което означава, че и потребителите поръчват повече продукти, през самата апликация. Не на последно място, апликацията ни дава и възможност ние да сегментираме потребителите по тяхното приложение много повече, отколкото Facebook или Google ни дават като възможности и съответно да рекламираме до тях много ефтино, т.е. направо безплатно, чрез push нотификации на база на безкраен набор от сегментации. 
Така че ако ти си онлайн търговец, имаш e-commerce магазин и искаш да имаш мобилно приложение, което твоите клиенти да ползват, може да си запазиш час за разговор от линкът в описанието с някой от екипът на Beyond Card, който ще ти покаже как изглежда приложението и съответно какво е нужно за да стартираш и да публикуваш твоето приложение още сега, като Beyond Card работят с почти всички големи платформи като Shopify и WooCommerce. А сега нека се върнем и към видеото. You know what? Let's let's start with uh, with your story because I'm always curious about the person's story and background. Well, yeah. First is well before before we go on. What I found amazing about Bulgaria because I've, I've not done many podcasts here, mm-hmm. but what I have done is a lot of people interviewing me prior to a podcast. Okay. And I've done a lot of po- podcasts in the UK and in other countries, Dubai. Um, I've even done some in the Middle East, uh, other places in the Middle East. But what I'm finding about Bulgarians that I've done podcasts with is you're so prideful of your podcast which is amazing and you're very protective over who comes on and the messaging that you're putting out which I've not actually seen as as heavily as I've seen here and I think it's so important that you are really defensive and, and aggressive at protecting who comes on and what you're doing so it's been a pleasure actually having people say oh can we have a meeting prior to going on a podcast I'm, I'm very careful with who I let on even smaller podcasts they haven't allowed themselves to just let anyone through the door I think that's really important and um and it's the reason I think your podcast has been so successful obviously I've had a little look at it I try and understand what I can in Bulgarian but <laughs> so apologies for anyone that um under- misunderstands me in English but no you built an incredible incredible uh, podcast so thank you for having me on Thank you it's a pleasure to have you on uh do, have have you studied Bulgarian I haven't yet so I'll be totally honest with you me coming here was predicated on pretty much tax and business reasons economically it made sense i never had any intention of really spending much time here mm. at all it was only that i came here and very quickly fell in love with the place i almost didn't want to because i have my family my kids i have two boys wife a doctor at home and when i go somewhere and i, I find somewhere i like it's like oh shit I'm going to have to now spend more time in this place because I love it. And it was initially a bit of a love-hate relationship because I was like, I'm definitely going to want to spend more time here, bugger, um, because I've got a really good home set up. I've got a very great family, really supportive uh, wife, great kids, great in-laws, funnily enough. Um, my parents are great. And Sofia was kind of unexpected. Bulgaria was unexpected because it's been so amazing. It's been so pleasant. People have been so nice to me, been so welcoming. The market here, as we'll probably talk about, is I think on the edge of exploding, especially the digital spaces that you and I both seem to swim in quite a lot. So there's so much opportunity, so much fun here. It feels like a lot, there's a, I, I mean, I love the UK, but there's so much about it I don't at the moment. And there's so much here that it just feels like it used to for me in the UK. And I feel a lot more at home here, ironically, than I do back in the UK at the moment. So I'm spending as much time as I can here, much to my wife's dismay. But um, Does she come and visit? With she does. Um, she does. She comes out. We've got a, a place in Boyana now. Um, absolutely love it there. The, the air is so clean. The, the weather's amazing. It's raining back in the UK right now. It's sunny outside. We came over here. I was like, I'm blessed to be alive. It's been great. Yeah. You know, I, I used to live in the in the Netherlands for a while, so the weather is kind of the same okay. as the UK, and I really <laughs> Great. loved everything apart from the weather, and that really, really, really uh, uh, had a had a huge huge impact on me, especially come winter time. You know, have the winter blues, the the seasonal affective mm-hmm. disorder thing. It's very hard for me to stay motivated even here, although I have found my ways. But there, it was terrible because like the winter blues extend all the way through summer. So there's really no no break for this. Well, there's no we haven't even had spring yet. It's mm. still so wet there. But I kind of thrive on that environment too. Mm. For me, I've always used that as a framework for if I can thrive in an environment that no one else can, doing things that no one else can do even in good conditions, then I'm yeah, going that's, places. Yeah, that's a good mindset. So yeah. I, I see it as something that's a challenge and I frame it that way. I think for me, anything that I do in life that's hard is I'll try and frame it positively because if it's going to be something I've got to do anyway, I may as well try and find a way of enjoying it or at least being able to do it each and every single day. There's no point trying to find reasons why I don't want to be doing it because you've got to do the bloody thing. So what is the damn point? The belief systems are so important that you frame your body and mind into because it's non-negotiable. We've got to live the life. We've got to wake up every single day. We have to go to work. We've got to feed ourselves. So why not try and enjoy it? At the very least, find the positives and build frameworks and belief systems because belief systems aren't factual. They're built in our mind. 
So we can actually manipulate those to either benefit us or hinder us. Well, I want to enjoy my bloody life. So let's build things that makes me enjoy the thing, even if it's tough. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, and the opposite is true. And this is part of what we're going to talk about, about the, the victimhood mentality that a lot of people have. And um, it's funny enough that you're coming here because you see the huge potential in ecosystems. Uh, but most people here think that, you know, this is the worst it's ever been for Bulgaria. There's like no opportunity. It's time to get out. It's time to go to, to the UK, whatever. Like, just pick a country that's, uh, you know, at least on paper doing better. And obviously, every country has its issues. Uh, but you have chosen to come here specifically. And it would be interesting to explain why and give that. Yeah, so I suppose, like you said, a bit of my backstory. So one thing that I've always been gifted at is predicting what's going to come. I think that's a good trait in anyone that's entrepreneurial is there's a lot of really gifted entrepreneurs, but if you're in the wrong vehicle or you're in the wrong industry at the wrong time, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, you're always going to be fighting an uphill battle. Whereas a lot of big entrepreneurs, you'll see a lot of like Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, uh, Richard Branson, whoever. Yes, they are gifted entrepreneurs, but there was another thousand gifted entrepreneurs that were born in a different time frame, in a different market environment that didn't get the same luck they had because they weren't in the right place at the right time. It's a combination of a lot of factors, including talent and also when you were born. Um, this guy called Malcolm Gladwell who wrote a, book, wrote a book called Outliers that talks about this quite yeah. in depth. And one thing that you can do is increase the favor of your success by seeing what's actually working at the time. So for example, if you're in a, a an old school print business where you're manually still printing newspapers or whatever, and there's a digital technology coming out, but you choose to avoid that and try to keep your digital, uh, your your manual printing business going, you're gonna get absolutely wiped out by the technology that's coming no matter how good you are as a businessman. So what I've always been good at is seeing what's coming. And I was born luckily in a generation when the internet was just coming to fruition. I was one of the first people to use Google AdWords. So the first thing I did when I was 13, I had a Windows 95 PC, right? I was lucky enough to have one. So I was afforded quite a lot of opportunity as well. I was in the right country, the right place. And I started building websites at 13. I had a web design company at 13. People think that I'm making that up. I wasn't. I was into Warhammer, which is painting little figurines. Yeah. And I thought, oh, these new websites, these are pretty cool. I'm going to make a website and I'm going to take photos of my picture, my, my figurines and I'm going to put them on a website. So I use a software called Microsoft Front Page, which is a really old clunky software where you can actually build websites without coding. It's one of the first ones that came out because you need HTML and C, C++ normally to build a website, mm. maybe some JavaScript or something like that. And I built my first little website. And then I thought, this was at 12. People are gonna need these websites. Anyone that's got a business, I'm like, well, if I can do this and put this online, this is gonna be the new shop front. I, I thought about it at the time as like a brochure. So I was like, oh, companies are gonna to wanna to show their products online. So if you've got a, a garden fact, like manufacturing company and you're selling tractors or whatever, or lawnmowers, they're just gonna to wanna to have their brochures online so you could send it to show it to more people. I wasn't really into the e-commerce space at that point. I didn't really know much about that. It was literally just, it's going to be just a way of showing your products to more people. So I was like, well, if I start building these and selling them to people, that beats doing a paper round. So I never, you know, to this day, I've never worked for anyone, by the way. I've never had a boss. Hmm. Never had a boss. And that's because of the, the, the time I was born. I was lucky when I was born. Um, and this is the same thing with Bulgarians. They now have access to things that their previous generations never did. We are in a time of absolute privilege and opportunity. And we'll go into that a little bit more. And then that, like that, so then I spoke to my dad. So he had a small manufacturing company, which I think helped me. He made. I was about to yeah. ask if there's an entrepreneur in your family. So my dad, he's, he's, he's entrepreneurial in the way he thinks, but he's never had a big business. He's always just got by and that's, he's done really well. My mom, um, she's, she's not, she's not a, an entrepreneur and I've had nobody wealth. I've got no one in my family that's, quote unquote wealthy I've not come from money at all <laughs> very blue collar like working class background which I love and I, I would never ever change it but what my dad running his own little manufacturing company taught me was that's actually a thing that you can do 
you don't actually have to be in a nine to five or you can actually do something other than what the system tells you to do, which is very important, I think, for my belief systems. We just talked about belief systems. So I believed that there was an alternative. And I was like, well, Christ, I can make websites for people and actually sell this thing that they're going to need. I was like, the whole world's going to need one. And I'm going to be one of the first people to, to, to build and offer it. So I, I uh, basically just asked everybody in my class at school, every parent that I met, every teacher that I met, do you want a website? Do you want a website? And they didn't even know what it was for really at the time until I found a, I found, I found a company that actually had a, they sold switches and sockets and they gave me a go. I think I charged them at the time. It was 300 pounds. It took me about six months to build the thing on Microsoft front page. It was slow. It was clunky, but I built it and I made 300 pounds and it was the best feeling in the world. And at that point I was like hooked. I was like, right, okay. Then I bought coding books, like, I bought, this time there wasn't really even YouTube going, so you couldn't just go online and learn. So I had to learn from books and implement. Um, I'm not, <laughs> there, was a, there, was a, there was a community, it was a hacking community back in the day, right? And it was, it was nothing like severe, but basically if you signed up, you paid a little bit of money, you, you learned basic coding to, to hack things. So I, I wrote some software that people don't even know, probably know what this is, but floppy disks, they're mm. old like little disks where you could store stuff on like 32 megabytes or even lower. But I could send someone a code and it would like open their disk drive or stuff like that. I was, I was coding stuff like that. So I was learning it on the little network there and I had people that teach me to code on that. And then I thought, right, okay. So I started actually getting some more and more web design clients. And then by the time I was uh, 16, I was fully aware of e-commerce at this point. And a chap approached me that was actually through my dad and he was a lighting salesman. So he had access to really big brands like Philips and any big lighting companies that you, you know about, but he wasn't allowed to sell directly to the customers because he was working for Philips, for example, as a salesman. Mm. He'd sell to companies that sold. So he sold. was kind of like a sales rep. Yeah, he was a sales rep, exactly that. And he's not allowed to be seen to be selling. So he approached me and said, look, let's build a website. I'll give you my prices. We'll go 50-50. I just can't be seen to be on the company. So you can be the face of it we'll get great prices and I understand in anything in life, if you have good an advantage, you have an arbitrage and something, obviously if we can get the same buying power as people spending a million pound a year with that company and we're doing no turnover at the time, we're gonna have a really good opportunity to sell something that already has demand, sell it online. So that was it, we built a website, a lighting website. I was 16, I was going, in the UK we have sixth form which is just after secondary school. So the age is 16, 17, you go to for two years before university and you do what's class as your A-levels. And in that period you get a summer holiday. It was mm. about seven weeks. What I did was, is he came over and dropped off about 10 brochures full of products. There must have been about 15,000 products. So they didn't have the drives or the disc back then. It was like, here's your, we have a little a little uh, CD, it was a DVD of all of the images. And then you have to manually write in all of the descriptions of all of the products. I did every single one. But what I also did was, is I got a, I hired a couple of people in my class and said, look, I'll pay you to work over the summer holidays with me. We all, we all cycled down to my friend's house, Jamie, Jamie Short's house. And we just sat there putting in stuff like 16 hours a day, inputting products Monday through to Sunday. Heavy grind. Heavy grind. Like, I mean, we really yeah. went hard, but I saw the vision. I love it. And I had, I had, lo I just used some of my web design money, paid those two guys off because I knew I couldn't do it on my own. So I allocated them different roles as well. So we had three of us working together on this thing. I had someone actually building out the site a little bit more who was a bit, a bit more uh, familiar with, who used a platform called Zencart. Hmm. Still around, but it's open source coded, right? We built the website on that. And I remember, I was like, Spent my whole summer holiday, didn't leave. Didn't leave, the, didn't leave the, the, the computer the whole way through. And then I remember going, right, we're going live. I phoned up Mark, the guy that I was doing the business with. I was like, we're going live. Sit there. Day goes by, no orders. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, my heart, mate, I felt horrendous. You know, you put so much effort in, I just expected it. I was like, I was actually really like down the dumps because also I'd, I'd kind of bigged up my business partner as well, like just how well this is going to do. So Elliot, where are the sales? I'm like, I don't know. Never done this before. I was like, I gotta learn how to market. I gotta learn how to market. So I had a girlfriend at the time actually. And I said to her, look, I'd actually still doing pretty good with the websites. I said, we're gonna book us a holiday to go to, we're gonna go to Egypt. But I said, just to pre-warn you before we go, you won't see me. She went, what? I went, you're gonna sit by the pool. 
and uh, I bought how uh, Google AdWords for dummies. It was like a black and yellow uh, black and yellow book. And I basically just flew out to Egypt. She just sat by the pool and I just read this book the entire time of how to do PPC, pay-per-click marketing with Google AdWords. And this was just when AdWords was coming out. Like it was so like- So you got into it like 2007-ish? Oh, yeah, it was early. 2007, 2008. And I was early. Got home, I just read the book. I'm pretty good at reading a book and memorizing most of the stuff I do. I made some notes on it. I wasn't even on a computer. I was just memorizing the book, but it just gave me the concept. I was like, I get that. I just understood the concept. I understood what I need to do. I understood how to set it up. Went back, started running AdWords that week. Bosh, sales. And I was getting like, I think probably cost per acquisition, maybe 20, 30p. It was like- Yeah, back then it's like oh, cents. Dude, it was nothing. To get a view, it was, it was, just, it was like pennies. It was pennies, yeah, cents, literally. And then that was it really, that, that scaled massively. Within six months, I was still at college. I was driving, uh, I managed to buy a, a 911 Turbo Porsche before I went to university. I had uh, managed to open up two warehouses. I had six members of staff. It was, it was flying, like we were doing millions in turnover. Um, so by the time I went to university, I was already on, like, it was a seven figure business in turnover. I wasn't a millionaire at that point. Um, and then that scaled up. And then by the time I went to, I went to university, I did economics. Because I was still toying with the idea of, well, this might not be permanent. Mm. Um, I still wasn't. That's also good mindset. Yeah, I was have. also, I'm never, I, look, I'm a very big risk taker, but I always cover my ass. And that's why I'm able to take big risks because I always know that there's a worst you case always backup. Hedge. Always hedge. Yeah. Everyone should hedge. Yeah. Anyone that bets everything is an idiot. You can't bet everything especially when you have dependents. So you can get away with it a little bit more when I think you are, so the, the framework that I always use when you're going about to do any decision in life is, what is the absolute worst case scenario of me making this or taking this risk, right? And if you are someone that's got the ability to go and live at home with your parents, you've got no kids, you've got no financial outstanding with any other major institutions, if you go bang, and it all goes worst case. Are you still healthy? Have you still got a roof over your head? Can you still eat? That for me is like a pretty good base to build up from again. So if that's worst case, I'm pretty good. That's better than most people live like in the rest of the world anyway. So for me, that's not really a massive risk. And that was me in my late teens, early 20s. So I was willing, okay, what's the massive, what's the worst downside risk and what's the biggest upside? And then what's the percentage of those two things happening? Okay, and then I'll weigh it up. And then in that period, I was taking probably much bigger risks than I would do now. So I've got kids and a wife. That's my whole risk, uh, propensity for risk has changed. My appetite for risk has changed because I now have to be more careful with the downside because I can't be so frivolous because there's more things that could go wrong. But always hedge. So I'll always make sure that, okay, if I'm going to go all in on this e-commerce, I still have my web design company on the backup. So I know that that's still turning over a certain amount and actually paid me really well because that business that I was running with, that lighting business, a bit later down the line, I got screwed over in that business. Lost the company, I was a millionaire at this point. Lost the company. I, I had to, I had, guy was taking loans out in my name. Like I got fraud done on me, everything. Like it went completely skew if. But I always had a hedge and I still had other income streams which basically kept the more, what I did was, I'm going fast forward here because it's a really important thing. Because of that decision that I'd always made to hedge my decision, my head, my hedge my risks, I lost the lighting business, but I also had a house that I bought, and I moved out of that, moved back into my mum's, rented the house out so that I could cover the mortgage and yeah, have to sell it. Yeah. Right, just rent the whole thing out. But I'd already planned to do this if this ever happened. So moved back in with my mum. I had a lot of assets that I'd kept. I had some watches, some cars, things that I sold off to pay all the debts that had come in from from this thing, which weren't even my debts, but I had to clear them because I didn't want to have any, I was having legal issues. That's all wrapped up now. And I basically gave myself a foundation that I could build from with income coming in and enable myself to build back to where I was again in six months. But there's always a hedge. There's always a hedge. You always have to have a hedge. And that way you can take the risk and go and really f commit to that risk properly because that's also required. When you're going to do something in business, you have to go all in. And... uh yeah, so for me, the the e-commerce space was a blessing. I was very lucky, and once again, I had the opportunity to 
be born in a period where I was one of the first to it. I saw the opportunity, which, by the way, guys, anyone watching this is in Bulgaria, even in the Balkans, the whole of Eastern Europe is primed for massive expansion at the moment. You're starting to see it with property prices and everything starting to creep. Mm. People are starting to spend more time in shop- coffee shops. I go to the malls here at the weekend. They're getting pretty busy. Like, there's things that are oh, really man, starting fact, to... The more there's the things fact. that are indicating that money's here. Mm. And there's tech opportunity here and there's very few people doing it. Much for people's... <sighs> shock i think people see a few people doing it and think everyone's doing it there's a very small handful of people actually doing this stuff at the moment this digital stuff that everyone thinks is just overly saturated it's not so i was lucky um and then after all that headache with the, the e-commerce business like i said i was i was doing very well i became a multi-millionaire when i was in my early 20s very successful from business um but because of the skills i learned i put in the reps from building that when i lost it all I built it all back again. <laughs> so during that period as well, I also flew out to China. This is an interesting story. So I had the e-commerce business. We were doing mid seven figures a year turnover. And I was giving all my money to these wholesalers in the UK. So I thought, well, I create the demand. I have the power. If, I, if I'm the one that creates demand, I, have the, I control the flow of money. If I control the flow of money, I have the power. So why am I paying a middleman that's buying from China adding a markup to me and then I'm the one selling it to the customer. I was like, well, how do I get rid of this middleman? I go to China myself. Okay, just booked a ticket to Shenzhen on my, just on a whim, flew out. That was a mistake. So I flew out to Shenzhen, got a visa in London actually, flew out to Shenzhen, had a two uh, 90 day passes. So I'm allowed to be there for 90 days and then I had to leave and then go back in again, Um, which is fine. So. For my first 90 days, I flew in and got a hotel. I was like, then I was basically planning to look for an apartment, and then I was going to start visiting factories. That was my plan. So, got there initially, no one spoke English. Nobody. I couldn't find anyone where I was in Shenzhen, which is the southeast of Hmm. uh, China on the border of Hong Kong. No one spoke English. I was also met with a tremendous amount of racism, which I've never had before. They called me Guelo, which is white devil. (laughs) <laughs> like I, was, I was really, I think I was, it was quite a rare entity well, there. Was Jack back then I was well. bigger. Yeah, yeah, I was bigger as well. well so I kind of stood out like a sore thumb. Exactly, yeah, I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> so I stood out like a sore thumb. And uh, the first night I went to a bar. So I've got a hotel, went to a bar and uh, met a couple of, actually managed to find an English speaking person there. And uh, I bought a bottle of whiskey, put it on the table because that's what you do there. You tend to buy a bottle and you put it on the table. And then uh, there's a few people came around and then there's this Russian guy kept coming over, kept trying to take my bottle of whiskey. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? I was like, that's my whiskey. And he was like, it's my whiskey. I was like, well, it's not, I just paid for it. It's like, give it back, put it back on the table. Kept doing it. I said, buddy, look, it's my first night in, in China. I was like, let's not have a problem here. Cause I was petrified as well of the Chinese mm. police. They didn't want to have any issues while I was there. So it's my first night. This guy was getting a bit rowdy. I think he was obviously on a few substances, very drunk. Um, I said, look, can we step outside? He spoke English. And I said, can we step outside? And I just want to talk to you. Like, this is, this is not okay. I said, I don't want to have a problem. Literally, it's my first night in China. Went outside. He was slowing all over the place. I said, buddy, look, I just, could you just leave the table alone? It's my whiskey. I'm trying to have a good night. Next thing I know, he tried to hit me. Yeah, usually in the Balkans, when you ask someone outside, it's to have it a is, problem. It is, but I, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't even hear the guy inside. Yeah. And I was shouting at him. So, but I, I tried to talk and I, he was acting okay. And the next thing I know, he just swung at me. The guy's so drunk, I've like stepped back. He's missed me and I've gone, look, <laughs> I'm twice your size. I don't want to have a problem. Let's just leave me alone. Let's just leave it alone. He's tried to hit me again. So obviously then I had to, I put him on his ass. The, and luckily, because he was Russian, not Chinese, I didn't have any problems because I was told after if that had been a Chinese guy, I would have got absolutely probably yeah. swamped. The bouncers just laughed and then let me back in. And, uh, that was my first night in China. And then progressed into the fact that I couldn't get any uh, short-term rentals. I think either because of the fact that I was English or the fact that they just didn't really do that there. Um, it took me two weeks of just going to different agencies. I even hired a translator to help me speak to these agencies to find an apartment. Eventually found someone. If I paid six, uh, 12 months up front for the apartment, I only needed it for a couple of months. I didn't know how long I was gonna be there for. Paid them. 12 months for 
effectively two or three months. Went to the apartment. The landlords came with us as well because they didn't trust me. They, uh, the guy that was showing the landlord was smoking a fag, walked into the apartment, threw it on the floor, then gobbed in the toilet. And I was like, welcome to China. <laughs> that was the experience I got. So I was instantly very homesick. I managed to get on a complex though that had a, had a mall on the bottom. So in, mm. in Shenzhen, they were kind of industrializing quite a lot there. And what they were doing was building these big complexes where they had few apartment blocks on either either side and then a mall on the bottom floor where there was like food, retail, gym, yeah, everything, everything there. Yeah. So it's like a little self-sustained pod. And I was on like the 32nd floor. So I also realized I had massive anxiety. No one spoke any English and I, no one really wanted to help me either. So I couldn't get taxis. I couldn't get to the factories. I couldn't do anything unless I was hiring a translator the whole time. So what I did was, is I downloaded some mandarin software on my laptop and was like right i'm gonna give myself a week i'm gonna lock myself in my room and i'm gonna practice mandarin just so i can get by and then i basically would <laughs> practice i then get the lift down to the supermarket on the bottom floor and then i'll go and test out my mandarin on the checkout girl to see if she understood me <laughs> Like, this is no lie. This is literally what I did because I realized it's a tonal language. There's four tones in, mm. in, in Mandarin. So it's not like a, it's not just a, a straight vocabulary. You have to say like, Niao died summer. Like, do you have a bag? Yeah. You have to be tonal. And if you say it wrong, they have no idea what you're saying. So I had to test it because I can learn all this stuff. But if, unless I'm applying it and I did that enough times so that I could actually start ordering in a restaurant, directing a cab, because I was just using an app and stuff. Um, they have uh, WeChat there and other mm. platforms to get food. So I literally wasn't able to leave the apartment to start with. Then I got competent enough to be able to just get by and then actually started going to factories, started visiting re uh, different factories in um, the Guangdong province. And that's when I actually then started to build up decent supplier lists, negotiate, and actually managed to get my first order placed for my lighting, which I managed to get, I think it was a 70,000 pound order. I ordered it, I checked it, I got it shipped, and all while I was still in China, built up a good relationship with that factory. Um, and then that was enough for me, and I got a couple of other factories and ended up flying back to the UK about five months after I got there, in the end. Crazy story. And that enabled me to shift my profit margins up huge with the e-commerce. So that, I was, that's on the lighting business that you got screwed yeah, over. Yes, so then it wasn't long after that that I got screwed over. <laughs> but kept all the contacts in China. Obviously, mm. I put all the places, plans into place. I was one that did the, the I learned the marketing skill set. I was running the, 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 the kind of company front end. So from my perspective, when I lost everything, it was quite easy for me to build it back. Yeah, because you had the raw ingredients. But what was the next business that you started? It's a marketing agency. Marketing agency, okay. Yeah. So I realized that what I'd learned from e-com, e-com is one of the best industries in the world, by the way. And if you're Bulgarian or in Eastern Europe, I think it's something definitely people should look at because it teaches you a lot of skill sets. We just spoke about another chap before we came on who runs a, a like a delivery business. But mm. with that, he's got the ordering side, which is tech. You've got the logistics side, which is actually sending the stuff around and then you've got the fulfillment and then also like, making sure the product itself is good. E-com is very similar. You have to build the website, which is the tech. You have to understand logistics, which is purchasing, storing, sending out customer service, and then actually making sure that that product is good and handling after sales service. So you get a very similar spectrum of disciplines that you learn from getting very good in e-commerce and through building up a business and also learning import and everything that was associated with that, I basically learned every skill set that I could possibly ever need to sell something online. Yeah, I think e-com, because I have a service business, I have an e-com business, yeah. you know, I have a, a bunch of businesses overall. Uh, not, not as big, obviously, but still have dipped my toes in it. I think that the most important thing that I learned from running an e-com business is unit economics and just yeah. really, really dialing in, in your financials. Because usually with the service business, because the margins initially are so high, you don't, you're not required to be that knowledgeable, you know, be that good with the numbers. Mm. So you can have a bit of, you know, leeway. But with e-com, like, if you don't understand your margins and if you don't understand your economics, you're either s hindering your growth or you're actually uh, heading towards the cliff, but you don't know it. Yeah, you got to have all of the disciplines and you have yeah. to be, like you say, you got to be mathematical with your approach. You have to understand what it costs to uh, acquire a sale. 
like your 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 LT with your uh, average order cost values, all of your advertising yeah. spends, everything has to be margin, everything cash conversion has to be there. cycle, everything. And then you have to then tie that into the advertising costs. So you need to start looking at <laughs> how economical is it to market this thing, and if the numbers make sense. So there's so many different variables, and then run a team of people because then you're actually shipping something tangible. Service businesses are also brilliant in that aspect in that you don't necessarily have anything that you can break to send, to, to store, to ship. <laughs> you literally could just sell something online and it's service-based, it's, it's invisible. Um, so it comes with so many benefits in terms of skill acquisition and the ability to then move out, which then I realize that I love business. I absolutely love it. I'm like a kid at Christmas when it talks about new businesses. And for me, I love business so much that when I'm in the same one for a prolonged period of time, I do tend to get a bit bored. And although that might be the most optimal thing for me to actually make the most amount of money for the rest of my life, I'm also someone that wants to enjoy this journey. So I wanna wake up every single day loving my life and I love business. Although it's optimal for me maybe to run one business and get that huge, I love to learn, I love to be involved in different businesses. What better way than a marketing agency? Because I get clients coming to me from every walk of life. I've had people that smoke fish, that build tech companies in, in, in crazy places, that do artwork reproductions, trades people, every single industry. Then I have to learn the inner workings of that industry to understand the customer, understand how to sell the service, how to sell the product, how the markets work, how it ships, how to move logistic routes from across the world, taxation, treaties, all these different things, just from being in a marketing agency. And that just really fulfilled me with the ability to learn and be involved and to meet different people from different walks of life. Because, because I love business so much, I realized that I'm never gonna have, I'm never gonna be one of these guys that has a home life and a work life. I have a life which is me working. So I have to engineer the life that I want through the work that I'm doing and I did that through the enjoyment of actually dealing with different businesses through the marketing agency. And I absolutely love that side of things. And is it optimal? Probably not. Because it's probably more advantageous to really get highly tuned in on one thing and turn that into a billion dollar business and sell it. Probably. But would I rather have a life that I just really enjoy every day, still make a lot of success, have a lot of impact? Excuse the pun. Um, yeah, I think that for me was like optimizing the happiness as well, which is something that I've actually done a lot later in life. Uh, probably wish I'd done that a bit earlier. So yeah, marketing was the next thing. Then I went into real estate. Mm -hmm. um, that's been pretty can, big. Can I stop you here? Because yeah, I have yeah. like a, so many questions. <laughs> but let's start so, with, the, w with the, the one that's more pressing. So with the marketing agency, did you try to niche it in some specific way? Because back then probably had, you know, not a lot of competition back in the day. So it made sense to work with everyone mm -hmm. also because of what you said. But I was still curious what was the thought process because I'm pretty sure at that point you're knowledgeable enough to know that niching is good if you want to grow fast. But how how did you make the decision? Niching is 100% the way to do it. If you want to grow fast and be efficient, become very highly skilled in that area. Um, for me, that wasn't what I wanted to do though. Mm. Purely from a selfish perspective, I wanted to work with a an array of different businesses just to satisfy my desire to just learn different things and get better at business as a whole because i always thought as well the more industries and the more people i meet the more opportunities i get the more networking that i can build the better of a improvement i'm going to get personally and that's what i was quite focused on i've always been quite focused on personal growth not just my business's growth they're two separate things like my financial health of my business doesn't necessarily equate to the health of me and my, the improvement of me. In fact, quite conversely, sometimes when you're focused fully on the financial health of your business, it quite negatively impacts your personal growth and your personal health. So I found that to be the case. And for me, I was going for as many businesses as I could. And I was in a fortunate position where I think people from a lot of, from afar were seeing me quite uh, a lot on digital on side of things. And also I was getting approached by a lot of businesses for help anyway. So I got quite heavily involved in the beauty industry. Um, I was doing osteo uh, osteopathic clinics, um, beauty clinics. I had, I was very involved in fitness. So I had weight manufacturing companies. I was helping uh, a lot of people in the fitness space um, build their fitness businesses. Cause this was back in the time 
2013, 2014 was probably early doors. There was a lot of people that coaches that were getting very big. Mm. I was helping them create exercise ebooks, websites, membership areas. And I was you said yourself that. you're more jacked than now. And oh you, yeah, yeah. And I, you jacked now. I mean. Yeah. Oh, dude. I was. So you I, obviously you knew some of those guys. Oh, I was friends with a lot of the top pros, and like I was really in that community. Mm. So they <laughs> they used to call me the business guy. <laughs> so I was like, I was in the fitness industry, but I was the business guy. So what was quite nice is I come from a place of. I now fast forwarding again, I now help a lot of business owners. I, I mentor and have a, a mentorship business where we help a lot of people scale their businesses. And I've always been known as someone that did business first and that thing second, which is quite nice because most people do just get really good at that thing and then all of a sudden become the best mentor ever. There's a big issue with the industry. We'll probably talk a little bit about mm. that soon, but someone makes a couple of sales, they they like renovate one house and then all of a sudden they're a property expert. Yeah. Right. I was fortunate Oh, I say fortunate, but I was in a position where people had watched me for a long time build these businesses. They knew I hadn't made it from the fitness industry, and I was starting to help people in the fitness industry with the skill set that I had, and that was very desirable. So I had a lot of people approaching me from all different areas. But to answer your point, if you want to aggressively grow something, become the best motherfucker at that thing you possibly can, and just know the customer, the service, the competition, every environmental aspect and statistic that you could possibly imagine. Like, in golf and go all in on that one niche and you will aggressively grow a business much faster that way don't try and be too broad i imagine you probably deal with this a lot right it might also depend on the market though because i know it what does. they say in you know in the us the usa they say like one product one offer one million mm -hmm. one channel but if you try to do it in bulgaria i mean like it can be one offer one channel 20k but pretty much after that it's it's very hard you've heard a guy called mo an Indian chap, one of the richest mm. men in the world. It's a very good point you made. So he's, he's called he's Mo, Mo Products, basically. He realized this. So he's, he's an Indian guy. He sells pretty much absolutely anything that is consumed in India is sold from this guy. Everything. And he said this. He said that, obviously, because I'm selling to Indians, the average wage here is a fraction of pretty much anywhere else on the planet. And the stuff, the cost that I can actually charge are a fraction. So he decided that he knew that if he was ever going to become a billionaire, I forget his actual name, his full name, I have to sell a lot of different things at massive, massive volumes. They pretty much said, if you wake up in the morning in India, by the time you go to bed, every single interaction you had with a product that day would have been from him. I mean, the plastics, like so the oils, like the, the food, the carbonated India. drinks, the pharmaceuticals, yeah. everything is his. And he makes a little bit off of every single product yeah. to make him a billionaire. So he had to go broad because of the market conditions. So yes, but I say that in it, with a pinch of salt. It is far easier to niche down and sell a message to a particular target market that has a set of problems or a problem, ideally one problem, that you can solve. And then, so what, all, mar all what marketing is, right? So this is how a marketing agency works, is someone has a problem that might be they can't get into shape right and you hold your hand up and say look i'm actually someone that can help you with that i can get you into shape i can do xyz this is what's going to be the solution the reason they don't hire you is because they don't trust you so that gap between problem and the fact that you're telling them you've got a solution is what i call the distrust gap and then what we do as marketers is help people trust you more in that you can help them solve the issue that they have and believe that you're actually the one to do it. And the stronger that belief, which normally comes through brand, I think Jeff Bezos is famous for saying this, what brand is, is trust. You just trust based on the brand that that person is actually, or that thing is actually gonna solve the problem because it's been done a million times over or there's a certain amount of trust that's associated with the longevity of that thing. When you're starting out in a business, you don't have that trust, you don't have that brand, that distrust gap is very big. So by niching down, what we can do is we can actually provide content, give value, really nurture that person into believing that you can actually be the person that helps them with that problem. So you make that person very aware of the fact that you're able to solve that. And that's where niching comes and is very important. Now, if you're in an unfortunate position where the market's a bit bigger, you might have to do that with a few different things and be a bit, a bit more creative, but definitely, the niche mindset is where I'd, I'd be 
first of all looking to go as a bit of like tactical oh, help. Oh, for sure. Because also like the all markets and digital spaces, uh, at least the ones that people would think of first, they're saturated. So if you don't niche down, you're competing against full stack agencies that are way better than you anyway. The other thing is well, people do wrong, in my opinion, is they reverse engineer things, the wrong things. So for example, we could look at Mo, that big guy, or we can look at whatever water yeah. bottle this brand is, right? And the thing is, you're looking at a multi-million pound company and you're going, right, I'm going to use the same mod method and model that they have. They didn't do what they're doing now to get to where they are, right? Same way as if you look at Jay Cutler or Ronnie Coleman or any mm -hmm. massive bodybuilder and you try to replicate their exact diet and training regime on the day that you see them, you will die. You'll be dead. They didn't do that from day one. So what you do is you take someone where they're, they're currently where you want to be and say, okay, what did they do to get there? Because that's what I'm going to do. And that's normally a much better way to look at it. So what big companies can afford to do is be quite broad because they have the brand, they have the trust, so they can crank out a product and people just buy it. When you're starting out, you don't have that, like you say. So it's reverse engineering the wrong things and being careful not to do that. And when things are saturated, not looking at, the big boys and trying to copy what they're doing because they've already earned the right to be able to do that. They're in a different, they're in a different or part of it. Or even worse, you see what they've done and you try to copy that, but that arbitrage is gone. <sighs> because with fitness, for example, uh, people see what initially the, the big mm -hmm. uh, YouTubers did, which is like crank out content, value content, whatever. And they're like, I'm going to do the same. And then you're broke for two years and you don't know why. <laughs> because that doesn't work at all. And it will work for people that already caught the trend and they're famous and they're well known and they have mm -hmm. the brand because people already have, you know, the experts in the back of their head. They trust them. They don't, they don't need new experts. They have enough experts in their head. So yeah, that's also uh, a curious point that you mentioned. I wanted to, to use this opportunity to also go a bit back. We can go to the, to the real estate business as well. Cause that's an interesting one. Uh, but, uh, were you, were you a natural leader when you when you were little or did you acquire that as a skill set? Because from everything you've told me up until this point, I can see two things. First, really high agency. And second of all, natural leadership. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was, but I was. What I've always been good at doing is, uh, my dad actually told me this when I was very young. He said the best skill set that you could possibly have is social skills before anything else, the ability to communicate with other human beings is by far and away the number one skill that you can possibly develop. Because even if you're good at nothing else, but you're good at people making like, well, making people like you or influencing people in a certain way, you'll do very well in life if you have nothing else and just that. So for me, that stuck with me as a very young kid. He told me that very early on, one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me. And I think, that a lot of it comes from a natural ability, but also you can work on it as well. Um, the actual ability to lead and influence people. But what I've noticed from a very young age is I have an unwavering belief in where I'm trying to go. And I have always set targets and I've never allowed anything to detract me from those things. And what I found with that is that when you're someone that is uncompromising in the journey that they're on, I call it the steam train now, like it's a snowplow. I'm fucking on it. I'm going to my destination. And it doesn't matter who you are, you're not going to knock me off my course. And if you're with me, you're with me. If you're not, you're not. I don't care. When you are that person, it's very compelling. Because what people try and do, especially when you're young, is pull you into their path. It might be smoking, drinking. It might just be playing a different game to the one that you want to play. All these different things. But when you're uncompromising and you're like, I'm going here, I'm authentically yourself, you're on your own mission. People follow intuitively to that kind of person because you're not willing to compromise or get or sell out on your goals. And I've always been that way. Like, I think that might be through selfishness or just a, a, a need to go where I'm going that people quite like being led by that because they want to be behind a leader that knows what they want and knows that they're uncompromising in their ability to go and get that thing. And then with that, what I've also been good, which I think the social skills come into, is the ability to show people, convince people, influence people on the positives of coming with me to that place. And I can sell them on my vision. And then by doing that, I can recruit the right people to assist me on that snowplow to make sure that we get there. 
Because that's one thing I learned early on is that whatever it is you're doing in life is very difficult to do it on your own. And it's also very lonely. So it's really good to have a strong team behind you. So even if it's, we're gonna go and play this particular game, we're gonna recruit the right people that are gonna be the best at that game. And we'll sum how good it's gonna be once we've actually won that game and how fun it's gonna be at that place rather than going to do the other thing that everyone else wants to do. And that's something I've always been good at. And I try so hard. Leadership is the hardest thing in the world for me in, in terms of getting that right. It's the hardest thing in terms of you have to sell a vision which is yours to other people and get them to commit themselves above and beyond any form of rational behavior to sacrifice on pretty much your vision. So it's getting them to believe in your vision as much as their own. That's not an easy sell. You can sell anything else a lot easier, but trying to sell a lot of people, powerful people, influential people on that same thing as you that you initially had, that's powerful. And if you have the ability to do that, you can create the biggest businesses in the world, you can create the biggest movements in the world, the biggest philanthropy, whatever you wanna do, that comes from that power. And that's something I'm constantly trying to work on. But it is something that came naturally, but I've really tried to craft on it and something that I've introspectively analyzed in myself daily. Mm. It also has to come with the ability to create uh, an outstanding product. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> otherwise, I mean, the vision f is falling uh, apart, you know? Product or also being able to live up to the promises that you make. Yeah. In essence, that was... I'll hold my hands up to this, for. right? I've... Yeah. I've done this not long ago actually with teams where I am so believing in the vision and where it's going to go and how amazing it's going to be and you don't always hit the mark that's fucking life like I had done everything in my power before to get to a place and not quite made it but that's not failing that's part of the journey that's part of learning but when you've led a load of people with you on that it's one thing pushing yourself to a point and not quite making it, although you've given it everything. It's another thing pushing yourself to a point, having led 10, 15 people with you on that same vision, taking them along for a two year journey, only to not quite have made it and they believed in you. So what are you doing How the that fuck do you swallow that? You have to explain that one, we're human, two, that we're gonna manipulate and move the goal, and three, really just re and try to unite that, that, that faith and love in you again, which is extremely difficult. And you will lose people. That's leadership. It's not perfect. And this shit's fucking hard. Like it really is difficult. And people look at guys like us and they see our success and they see all our teams and the way that we're all happy families and everything else. Yeah, those are on good days. Fucking bad days too. Really fucking bad ones. And when things like that happen, it's happened to me recently. It's the biggest kick in the nuts that you'll ever have and it hurts, it's stomach wrenching. It's the bottom of your stomach because it's not you that you've let down because that's easy. I can let myself down all day long but letting other people down that you've sold on this vision that had put everything into you is the worst thing in the world. It's the worst thing in the world and it's the closest thing that I'll ever get to wanting to quit. But I won't. But it's at those periods that you ask yourself and you doubt yourself more than you could possibly imagine. And coming back from that, that's true leadership. That's true leadership. If you can get back after those losses and reunite those people and get them back on another journey, get them to re-believe in you again, then you're a true leader. Yeah, when you, I think that for me, the criteria is not, um, well, obviously what you said is like the prime example of a leader, but I always thought of my leadership because I'm not that advanced in, in, in our businesses is, like assuming the responsibility for the people I employ and for their families, because they're making mm -hmm. the sacrifice for me, <laughs> obviously, and I have to provide, you know, the paycheck and not just the next one, but the next 12, right? Or 14 or whatever. So I need to be on top of my game so that they can, you know, live a normal life. And for me, that's like the biggest responsibility in the world. Th that's where, that's what can make me quit is like this level of responsibility and not being able to provide for the people that we employ. Let me ask you this. Obviously you're, you're, you're well known. You're, you're doing really well. Um, you've had a successful, successful career this far and it's going to be a hell of a lot better. I'm guessing you get a lot of people that look at you and aspire to be just like you and have your life. 
would you say to everyone that it's desirable as it looks from the outside all the success given what you've just told me about that level of pressure uh i would say it depends on the person yeah for me for sure because this helps me become better mm -hmm. and coming back to what you said you, you kind of made the, the the separation between your your personal life um and and your business life and personal development and business uh, it's it's a bit interesting because I look at my personal development and and my business as the same. If I'm advancing in my if I'm leveling up my business, for me m money is obviously a motivation, but a bigger motivation is making cool things that people enjoy, and money and the realm of you know making more and more is just a new level in which i can test my own skills and build my own new skills mm -hmm. you know that's the the way i develop myself personally i mean spiritual development is another lane that can do with business but in terms of purely personal development it's this and i wouldn't deprive someone who will view it the same way from that journey obviously corporate life can be very fulfilling as well mm -hmm. it's awesome especially some companies uh, here you know, huge tech companies in Bulgaria, they, they give nice salaries, you have amazing perks, you don't have to think about the business the next month, because especially for a service business, when you had the marketing agency, and, and a lot of people that are in the service business, they know, every month is like, you start from the bottom, like you, every month, you have to build, build it up again to where it was last month, probably, you would like uh, uh, to grow. So it's, it's like a constant grind, but I love it. Like, uh, as you said, like that, that summer where you, you know, manually typed all the descriptions. I love the heavy grind. I enjoy it. Um, we even talked about this with, with my buddies that have e-com businesses uh, a few days ago because they had some, someone asked about, you know, being a bit scared of losing it all, mm -hmm. what's going to happen. I'm like, the way I combat that is that I, I enjoyed the grind so much that I, I kind of feel even enthusiastic about the possibility from starting from <laughs> scratch. It's like, this is going to be an amazing journey, even if it happens. Hopefully it won't, but if it happens, it's going to be like when we, we got it to play computer games all night, but this time it's going to be something else. It's going to be business, you know, building something. I know I can build it better if I start now, because there's a lot of legacy that you can't replace that easily, but if you start from scratch, you, obviously you can build it better. Uh, so yeah, I would say... The only thing I say to those people actually is that they only think about the good stuff mm -hmm. and I would invite them to think about the bad stuff. And if they can live with that, then they should totally do it because the, the good stuff is obvious, right? Because you've already seen it. Even if, if you don't think about it, you subconsciously assimilated it, it and that's why you strive towards it. But you need to consciously visualize the bad stuff, like the the moments where there's no new clients coming in and, and lead gen stopped and Facebook has blocked your account and you know whatever and you have personal issues on top of that and you need to pull you know two 16 hours days like actual 16 hour days not because <laughs> people say I work 16 hours a day and man it's like a, a, a focused 12 hour day is gonna wreck you oh it destroys you yeah it's like so two actual focus 16 hours days means like three days afterwards you're dead uh, but they need to put in that and you need to deal with all of this. And if you can, if you can find enjoyment in doing it, if you can persevere and view it as like a growing exercise experience, then sure, this is the perfect life for you. But if you are going to fold under pressure and you don't want to deal with people and you want to just boss around people and tell them what to do, then this is probably not for you because you're going to buckle with the first hardship. Mm hmm. And like going off on a bit of a tangent here, yeah. talking about hardship, this is what I've loved about Bulgaria so far. So since I've been here, I think I'm on to coming up to my eighth hire now of Bulgarians. And fucking the energy and the tenacity with some of the younger guys here is just invigorating. I found that I hire a lot of people. And in England and America, I find that the work ethic and a level of entitlement is there, which is very present in a lot of people that I interview and I try and bring on for job roles. Here, I'm finding it the other way around. There's a few, obviously, in every in every country, in every culture, but 
the Bulgarians and especially people in the Balkans, they've got something to fucking prove. And mm. they see the opportunity that they can actually now do something with their lives that doesn't require them to migrate out of Bulgaria and go to the West to try and find money and, and build a different life. They're like, well, no, I think I can stay here. And there's this new tech available. And fucking I've been given this opportunity by Elliot and we've now got this, I'm going to work. And quite often they're coming to me saying, Elliot, I'll work for free. Just give me the chance. I'm like, what? I've had that for a while. I now have probably a probably listen to this podcast. Oh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but now I have a team of Bulgarians, mate. They're animals. My businesses are doing better than they've ever done. And I attribute that to them. Honestly, my COO, Lobov, she is the best, best operations officer I've ever had. She started off as my executive assistant. I quickly promote her to my chief COO for one of my biggest companies. Mm. She's that good. She's ruthless. Never complains about work. Works well above and beyond what she needs to. So if she hears this, she probably asks for a pay rise. But um, insane. And then she was my first hire. And since then, I've just been, who can I hire from Bulgaria? How did you find her? I was through Upworks. Okay. Up I literally was desperate for a job role and was like, I'm just going to try Upworks. Because I, when I when I hire, I hire everywhere. I'll, I'll hire on every every uh, Indeed in the UK. I'll put stuff out, especially if it's a remote. I'll try everywhere. Hmm. For me, if I get if I have the bigger team to select from, the better quality of team I can pick. Right. So I'll just I'll really hit and I'll I'll really invest quite heavily on quickly trying to find someone for a particular role. And then I'll give them a trial and a paid trial to do what they actually have to do and whether or not I don't read TVs. Hmm. This is my job process. If I have a job role, I'll put it on as many platforms as I possibly can to try and recruit that person. I'll also put out personal messages if I need to on social media and everything else. I'll get as many people as I possibly can in that I think are good. I will I won't read a CV, but I'll just base it on the messages that they send me or a few bit of criteria on something they've done in the past. And then I'll say, right, you've got a week or whatever time period to do the task I want them to do. I've already mapped it out and you're getting paid for it. And then Whoever's the best is going to get the job. And when I say the best, it's how they interact with the rest of the team, whether or not they do things on time, how it, how they actually function as a member of the team, not just the, that particular piece of work that they did, because that mm. doesn't mean anything to me. I need it to actually work synergistically within the company. And then I'll hire that person. And then I'll give them a probation period of maybe one to three months, maybe sometimes six months, depending on the job role. And then we'll review it. That's it. Simple. And I'll fire really quickly if they're not up to, to scratch. What I'm finding with Paul Karens is I'll do that and they'll, they'll go above and beyond. It's like, well, I've done this as well. And I've done this as well. Holy shit. These guys can work. Not only that, they're like, what more can I do? I had my, a guy called Boris the other night. He went out. It was 10 o'clock uh, Bulgarian time. I was in the UK. It was 8 o'clock. It was on a Sunday night. And I gave him some material to, 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 to knock out in terms of like learning some, some marketing strategy. He was like, I've uh, smashed through that today. I'm just going to the, gonna go out for a run now. It's 10 o'clock at night. When I'm back, I don't want to sleep. Can you send me some more stuff to do? I'm like, are you sure? You should probably go to sleep. That's his mindset. I'm like, that's me when I was younger. I was like, well, I haven't found that in the West for a long time. And I'm I'm just so invigorated and it's re reignited my love and hope for people. And I know that now with the, the kind of, the foundation, if, if there's more people like that out there and they're watching this and they want to start their business, you can fucking kill it. Especially when you're going to go out and compete against people that are sleeping, that think that a 16 hour day is waking up, doing two hours of self reflection meditation, having a cold <laughs> bath, doing yeah. a couple of hours of light work and emails, going to the gym for four hours, going back to, to work, doing a couple of Zoom meetings and going to bed at nine o'clock after a Netflix series, which is educational. That's what they think a 16 hour work day is. If you're willing to craft, Christ, you can have these people for, you can take their lunch money. And I'm like, what? And especially with the way that the, the Eastern market's picking up, I'm seeing more people engaging in digital services. Like I said, in Sofia, the house prices are going crazy. Like there's really good signs here that there's economic reform. I see nicer cars drive. We spoke about this before. Yeah. There's nicer cars drive around here than there is in London. I mean, I know that there's, <laughs> you said that people may be a flex here a little bit harder. It might not be the yeah. best financial decision, but there's money here. People can spend it. And if you can sell a low ticket product to a lot of these people, you can do very well. Or you can get involved into these industries that are coming to market. The same way I got into AdWords early, in my early doors. If you can read this right and you can spend that summer holiday banging in and doing the graft, there's a real, real opportunity here for people. And you guys are amazing people. You've got 
so much love and pride for your for your country. It'd be great if we can actually start helping you guys like us build an infrastructure where people don't actually have to leave. I speak to so many people that, and and, and Boris as well. He's even potentially he's studying in Germany, and he's not even thinking moving back to Bulgaria because I've paid him a wage that's now enabling him to stay here because he loves his family, loves playing here. He just wasn't able to. He didn't think he was able to financially. The opportunity is here. And that's the message I really want to drive home to people is that you don't have to leave if you don't want to. You just have to learn the skills of the 21st century, not the stuff they taught you in school that think that they want you to know about making money. It's very different now. And it's way more, it's way more attainable to the average person than you possibly even realize. Just have an internet connection. Yeah, people nowadays don't don't realize, man. Like we, we didn't have Stripe until four years ago or something five Mad, years ago. right and and you know people don't understand they don't know how hard it was to to take payments online before that it was it was actually hard you had to to jump through a lot of hoops and that's the basic the most essential thing you can you know do is actually receive money online right for your service so stripe problem problem solved super easy you can even uh, open a stripe account under uh, you know your, your physical physical name you don't need need a company to take payments you can just do it in an afternoon and right. you're already processing payments it's crazy so yeah the opportunity is there and um let's explore a, a bit more y- your business uh, journey because i really want to get into what what you do now but uh, where we left off was your real estate uh company mm-hmm. real estate business that was after the marketing agency yeah so i met my lovely wife hannah um mm-hmm. in her first year of medical degree and she was in a place called Stoke-on-Trent, which is north of England. You, mm. No one here would have heard of it, I'm sure. It's not the nicest place in the UK, but lovely people. Um, economically, not fantastic. But I had a really nice detached house, living the lifestyle. Had a Bentley on the drive, my Range Rover. And I was really, really happy with where I was at. And then I met her uh, one summer. And stupidly f- ended up... <laughs> not stupidly, but logistically was not not great on paper ended up um really liking her really really liking her and it was unfortunate that i was the one that was more flexible in terms of where i could be geographically so with regards to the real estate that then meant that i was spending a lot more time in stoke on trent which i didn't particularly like the place uh, like i said i like the people didn't like the place but i thought okay while i'm here she was working at the hospital she put me back in she had students living in a house she's very entrepreneurial as well my wife we both are very entrepreneurial she'd bought a house and was renting it out to students so she was smart smart but someone that's (laughs) done a lot of reps to get to a lifestyle where i was really happy living my own house having a nice lifestyle i was living with her with students again go back to my student days and i was like this is not for me, man. I was like, I can't <laughs> share in a bathroom with five other people. And I was, I was like, this is just, this is just a bit heavy for me. Uh, you know, arguments over who's done the washing up and all that kind of stuff again. So I said to her, like, look, if I'm going to, we're going to really make a crack of this thing and we're going to try and make it work. Let me start buying. Let me, let, let me buy us a house up here. And I said, like, it'll be a good investment because what we'll start to do is you rented out this place super easy. It's opposite the hospital. So what we'll do is we'll find other medical students when we've gone and we'll rent the two out. It's great money, right? Because the uh, the price up there was super cheap and the rental rates were pretty high for anyone that was at the university. And the model that we had was medical students tend to just work around the clock. They're very good students. They tend to come from pretty good backgrounds and good families and you know, they weren't any issue. So that was the model. They're not the ones who trash the place. No. And they also have very good guarantors and they're scared of the medical uh, commi- uh, the medical union mm-hmm. in the UK. Mm-hmm. So if they mess up, they get booted off the course. So they can't be seen to be doing anything negative. So we started mapping out a radius. I say we. I started mapping out a radius of the hospital and started picking houses that met a certain criteria for room rates. So I was going for roughly... 20 to 30,000 pounds per rentable room. And that's how I'd look to the price value of the house. So for example, if it was a, a four bedroom house, I wouldn't pay any more than 120,000 pounds for it. So that's how I worked. I had a little formula that I worked out. I was only renting to students. I knew where I was marketing to them on different Facebook groups and different uh, outlets. And I just started buying those. Um, and that model worked. It's, worked re- it's really Again, basic. It's, it's arbitrage. Yes. Yeah. You just found a place where you can buy cheaper than you can rent it out. Yeah. 
And it was basically just a way of passing time while I was up there as well and gave me a bit more purpose while I was there. And I found a more positive thing a vibe about Stoke because I saw a great opportunity in the market there. So I become a lot more positive about the area, made it easier for me to live there. Actually ended up building a really good network because I had all the trades people that I then got to know, like the electricians, the carpenters, the kitchen, mm. the plumber, everyone else. And then I got good friends with them and I actually built a really good base and community up there and I enjoyed it. Um, so that's where that came from, which is then just scaled out into more of the, more of the same really. Um, what I've always tried to do is I'll only invest in things that I know it's really important. Um, you know, you talked about risk earlier and taking risks. It becomes infinitely more risky the more you try to invest in something that you know nothing about. So people that are presented with things like crypto that they've never, ever done any research on or the next best thing that comes out, yes, it might sound like it and a lot of people probably are making a lot of money from those things, but you're relying on third-party information to make that investment decision. That's the stupidest thing you can do. So if you were to sit here, and, and people have asked me this before, like, how should I invest my money? I said, right, okay, if your brain was a pie chart and you segmented it up into your skill sets, invest it according to those. Your money should be a reflection of the investments that you make based on the things that you know the most. So if you know marketing, 80%, that's your biggest skill set, investing in a marketing agency will put more money back into your marketing business. Don't put it into real estate, which you've never done anything with, unless it's like a skill acquisition project, not to make money on. You can put money into things to learn. That's different. That's like acquisition. But in, as an investment, do it proportionately to the things that you know. And if you want to invest into something, before you put a penny in it, become an expert in the field. And I guarantee you rarely lose money. <laughs> you might do 10% of the time. But if you're investing based on someone else's knowledge, more often than not, you're going to lose your money. So that's a really good, a really good piece of advice for anyone that's looking to invest. Is just invest based on your skill set. You mean when you say invest, invest your money that you want to invest? Yeah. In, so let's know. say, for example, you had a pot of ten thousand pounds, yeah. and you're like, I want Elliot. I want to put this money into something to make a return. I would split it up proportionately based on where you think your skill sets lie because you're less likely to make a bad decision because you know that thing inside and out. For example, you run an e-commerce business. If you were to invest in e-commerce businesses, you'd have a very good idea about whether or not it was a good e-commerce business very quickly just by looking at the, the internals and everything else yeah. versus someone coming up to me going, you've never run an e-commerce business before. You should invest in that e-commerce business. It's really good. And you're going off of that person's word. <laughs> If you know nothing about e-commerce, then you're putting yourself at massive risk because you can't double check that and you haven't got any of your own experiences. So put it into things that you know. It's really not that simple. It's really not that hard. It just simplify everything. People overcomplicate everything and they think there's some shiny way of doing things. More often than not, it just comes off of knowing something for yourself and being better at it and being more skilled. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, because when I, when I talk about investments, obviously time is like the most scarce mm -hmm. resource. Uh, depends if you want to throw in energy in the mix, but you know you can invest your time in learning about the the, the sphere before you invest in it. What you said yep. and that's uh, that's I think the important mindset that a lot of people are missing out. As I also think people overly rely on YouTube videos <laughs> nowadays. I admit I'm guilty uh, of that a, a, as well a bit, but I truly value mentorship from people that have gone through it like we talked before the podcast at me and stan we've invested around a hundred thousand dollars in mentorship mm -hmm. and i've said that before and it's it, it's not a cap like i actually have you know all the receipts i can show it uh and that was because we're clueless on what to do and like the mo it, it, ma it made the most sense to pay to the people that have done this uh and they've done really well and they they're niche down in their industry and sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. But most of the time, it did work out. And it was still a better investment than if I had those $100,000. Because mm -hmm. it was spread out over years, right? It's not like immediately one year. But if I had it back then, and if I if I did put 10 k in crypto back then, I probably would have done fine. But I wouldn't have done as well as I did now. Because the skill acquisition was way more important. And there was also like... A good timing that we had back then with the with the fitness coaching so like there's a lot of elements of like your window of 
taking advantage of the arbitrage is closing in. So if you try to invest in a lot of places and need to, you know, even if you invest in crypto, now you need to, you know, uh, watch the prices, when to sell, like, it's like, it takes from your mental capacity, right? So you become slower and you might miss the window of arbitrage. That, that's how I view it. So I would always, I think Hormozzi said this, uh, if you're not making 100K per year, you should invest in mentorship un until mm -hmm. you make 100K per year. Because otherwise, like, it doesn't make sense to invest, like, $500 per month. Like, it's all right. It's not bad. But I would save it up, invest it into whatever skill acquisition. doesn't need to be mentorship skill acquisition. Then, you know, monetizing that skill if you can. Then invest a bit more into another skill that you need to monetize a bit more. And when you get the ball rolling and you make a lot of money and you have a lot more disposable income, then, I mean, you can obviously do that. But like myself, I, I uh, transferred all my crypto assets to a fund and now they manage it and I don't care about bull markets or anything and I feel a lot better. Even if I make less, which is probably not the case because I suck at investing, um, like it freed my mental capacity to think about the thing that's actually making me money, which is the businesses. But yeah, you said you suck at investing. Yeah. Why do you think you suck at investing? Uh, because it's not easy. Do you it's put money hard. back into your businesses? Yeah, I mean... So the thing is, it's the way you frame what exactly. I call as an investment. Exactly. So you are investing, but you're putting yeah. the majority of it into the I'm businesses. I'm good at reinvesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's the same thing. Yeah. And what you're doing is, it's, it's, if you've got a decent amount of money, it's still okay to hedge it with a small amount in something like crypto mm -hmm. that you has a potential upside. But worst case, again, if you lose it all, it's not the end of the world. And that's the way I would be looking at it. So there should still be a hedge. And you can get involved in those things. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you're learning a little bit more about that thing and acquiring skills by playing with the money. But you don't want to go and put your entire life savings and all of your businesses and everything and guarantee it against Bitcoin when yeah. you don't know anything about it. That's, that's just crazy. That's, that's gambling. And that's not healthy for anyone. Sometimes that pays off. But like you're doing, you're reinvesting in the thing that you know that cash flows for you which is your businesses, because that's where your skills acquisition has been, and that's where you're comfortable. And you talk about arbitrage, and arbitrage is amazing, and it's what I'm always looking for, always looking for it, because that's where the big money's made. However, if you do make a bum decision, and you try and get involved in something that is massively saturated, or didn't take off like you thought, or your product or service didn't have the, the market fit that you thought it might have, if you are still an expert in that field, yeah, you might have to work a hell of a lot harder but you still might make it just about work because oh, yeah. you know it inside and out. Yeah. Versus if you've got no idea, you've lost a whole lot. Yeah, so absolutely agree. The risk, the downside risk is always so much lower when you're good at something. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy period that we live in. And the access to information that's out there now is bonkers. So what mindset did you have though? Was it, what was the first amount you ever paid for mentorship? Do you remember? What what was it? Yeah, $8,000 for eight weeks. That was your first ever payment? Yes. That's big. Yeah, it was all the money we had. Okay. And and how old were you then? I think 20, 26, I think. 27, okay. maybe. And how did you make that decision to put that 8K in? Uh, it was a no-brainer for me. Because, I mean we're doing kind of okay, but we're kind of clueless. And um, our, our first mentor, he was already in that space doing this mm -hmm. specific business and he was doing really, really well. He was okay. also a good friend, which helped. So that's crazy. So you took yeah. 8K for yeah. eight weeks. Yeah. And how much further did that expedite your journey? A little 10X. 10X. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th the first, obviously, uh, Here's the thing, like we worked really hard for a long period of time and we had a lot of social goodwill. We had a lot of, you know, uh, good um, good social credit with our network, with our um, followers. And we couldn't monetize it well because we didn't know how and we didn't understand business, right? So the first mentorship was so impactful because we had done and we did put in the work. Mm -hmm. And I want to be careful when I explain this story because a lot of people think that every mentorship is going to 10x their money, which is not the case. Like, as I said, sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes it's probably because of us, sometimes it's probably because of 
you know, the mentor, although I would always take it on me because mm-hmm. I probably didn't choose wisely. But anyway, this was a very specific situation where that was possible. And it was literally 10x in two months. Just because he had already put in the grind and the work before that. I don't expect it to be 10x every other time. No, I think that's predicated off of, obviously, who you are as people. And the fact that you'd also started something. So you probably had extremely good questions and you also knew the gaps that you needed to fill. So No. You didn't? No, not even that. I'm just being honest here. The guy was just like, you guys literally don't know what to do. So <laughs> we're going to do this sales thing. And this is like how we can do lead gen. Obviously, that back then, our lead gen was super simple. Like we didn't need to go into lead gen at all. It was just like, you know, just better call to actions, just like a booking system for people to book sales calls with us. And, uh, you know, some email marketing, just like super basic stuff that nowadays you doesn't get you anywhere. But that was a different time and place. That's mental. Yeah. That's absolutely crazy. But actually having the balls to drop eight grand, eight thousand yeah. pounds on on mentorship is 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 difficult, especially when it's your first ever experience. Mm. Maybe it's naivety, but that that's it's a mindset that not many people have. And it's something that I, I can't see bang my head against a brick wall. You have so many conversations with people that say, like, Elliot, I'll do anything to change my life, you know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. As soon as any form of investment or time investment to something, you hear crickets. How do you expect something to come from nothing? That's like natural, (laughs) it's like natural science, it's physics. You can't create something from nothing, right? There has to be some sort of input to get an output. And that either requires your time or money to be invested. Usually both. Usually both. And mentorship is one of the craziest things ever because if you get the right person that has literally done the thing that you're trying to do made all of the mistakes got completely absolutely wiped out by every single thing they could have done hit every single booby trap along the way got like hurt bloodied bruised and then says right you want to do the same path but i now know the way through it and i can get you there in a tenth of the time it's going to cost you nowhere near the same amount and it's going to be a lot more pleasant that's what mentorship yeah. could be yeah, usually, usually that's what it is. Or it, it is also like, you know, all these things because you watch 10,000 hours of YouTube videos. So you absolutely indecisive. So pay me. So I tell you exactly what to do. And you're just going to do 1% of that, but do it really well, actually execute what I want it. And then you're going to start making progress because I, what I experience is because uh, you also do some mentorship on the side is, you know, y- young guys, they, they have all this information. It's awesome. Like they have this stuff that we didn't use, we, we didn't used to have, but it's so, so much information that it hinders knowledge formation. And most importantly, it uh, absolutely negates wisdom, at the, uh, um, you know, attaining wisdom. Because wisdom is like knowing when it's time to throw in the towel. Wisdom is knowing when to quit or rather when to pivot and when to push. That, that's like a Hermosi thing. He says, you gotta, when you hit the roadblock, you either need to push through it or pivot. And, you know, knowing a lot of strategies sometimes can be worse than knowing one strategy, but being focused on it and executing it well. Knowledge acquisition is one thing, and you defined it when you were saying that then. Knowledge acquisition is knowledge acquisition. That's in. That's, that's knowing something inside and out. Yeah. Wisdom is derived from actually doing the thing. Exactly. Because you can't learn to know when to throw in the towel. You can't learn to know when to push, when to pivot, unless, when to you do this, unless you're actually doing the thing. So when you go back to my real estate, for example, yes, I did well in that, but fuck me, did I make some mistakes? Because I tried to do it all on my own. So I had this model and I, I set it up. I was buying houses that had... They changed the rules in the area so that the room sizes had to be a certain size. Communal areas had to be a certain size. They had to have certain uh, fire ratings and securities. I bought all these houses that then all of a sudden I didn't know I had to do this with. It's cost me a fortune to then fix all of those things. I then had to have houses go untenanted for an entire year because I had to extend walls and put supports in to make the room sizes bigger so they conform to regulation. I learned the real hard way and it cost me tens of thousands of pounds, if not more, headache, stress, you name it, from not just paying someone to tell me how to do this thing properly initially. I could have got 
probably two weeks worth of mentorship and learned the basics, right? <laughs> and avoided those things. However, the fact that I still actioned it gave me the wisdom that I was required. And also, sometimes making a couple of fuck ups along the way yourself is a really good way to never do it again. <laughs> Like, because then you know when to throw in the towel for the next time or a decision to swerve because the pain of actually doing these things sometimes and being punched is also a good thing as well. Mm. So I learned from that experience. However, I'm now looking at some massive property developments. I don't know if you've seen on my stories recently, but one of my big goals in life at the moment is to buy a manor. And when I say a manor, I'm talking about something absolutely enormous in England because... That's a solid goal. Right. One big goal for me is to own a part of the English history and culture that you can't replicate with more money. So this is the thing I love about things that are old. And probably a bit why I love Bulgaria and the East because there's so much culture and history here too. In that no matter how much money you've got, you can't remake on the day a 70-year-old bottle of Macallan whiskey or a house that's been there for... 500 600 years has a load of history with it that for me is pretty amazing and one thing that money can do is you can buy into that but you can't replicate it so my idea is to buy a manor and bring it back to its former glory and have a hub in the uk where my team and everybody can run from there and we bring this thing back to life and then we we keep that history rolling and in doing that, I have to be, I'm looking at some very expensive manners, <laughs> right? Back to my original point. And I don't have the foggiest, I have no clue what I'm looking at. When I go walk around a 28,000 square foot manor house that's half falling down, that's looking at like seven, eight million pounds to buy this thing before I've done any work on it, what did I do? I hired a mentor that's had experience in those things before. There's not many of those people around. Yeah, I was about to say. Like, they're hard to find. find but guys? the first thing you do is find someone like that. So I reached out to my network. I have a really good property network now because I've hired people. And that's one thing I do is try and expand my, my network to find people that know things about mm -hmm. the things I'm trying to do. Because the last thing I want to do is just try and do it and make a massive mistake, especially when there's a lot more on the line. So I'm looking around this thing thinking, I have no clue make a few phone calls. How much is it going to cost me to get you here to look at this with me? Right? Pay me how many, many thousand pounds and I'll go through the whole thing. No problem, done. That few grand is going to save me potentially. I might not even go ahead with the decision. and I probably won't. But had I gone ahead with that decision and I made the wrong mistake, that could bankrupt me. Like, there could be millions and millions of pounds that <laughs> I was unaccounted and I tried to steamroll this project. That's how powerful that knowledge, that you can buy wisdom from other people in that it can give you the skills and the knowledge that when you're actually practicing and doing something, you can hire that wisdom in while you're doing it. Because when you're in the ring, you can have someone that's done it before going, Elliot, throw in the towel now, or Elliot, push harder now. But you have to be doing it too. So if you combine action with mentorship, wow, that's a perfect combo. Yeah, I was about to say that. Because I also know people that just jump from mentorship to mentorship <laughs> yes. and they're just like, think that there's like this secret that they'll learn and it will make everything yeah. all the problems go away but uh, you, you need to embrace the grind there's no other way like you need to love that if you don't love it it's gonna be hard well hard isn't necessarily negative right no it's not hard is just something that is required to create something right you have to nothing is built without some form of stress or, or some sort of push or, or movement it has to be some sort of energy given to something so normally the things that are most cherished in life were the hardest to create because the amount of sacrifice needs to go into that thing to make that thing which is beautiful same way like for example a great physique is hard to produce so it's coveted by people people want it because of the hardships people know that people have to go through to get it therefore it makes it desirable so if you reframe it in that hard is a good thing because it creates things in my life that I desire and that are, are, are nice and the things that I want, then it's actually good that it's hard. That's a stopping, it's a barrier to entry to everyone else. Yeah. That's what, what usually I think about. Like if, if it's hard, it means there's a moat. If there's a moat, there, it means there's longevity. If there's longevity, there, there, it means there's potential. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's... Um, that's a little bit about why I'm kind of 
in the space that I'm in now with, I, I moved from kind of property into the, the well, along with everything else, I'm still running those things and, and I, I love building businesses that, to, that kind of function on their own. But one thing I love to do now is help people build their own empires. So that's like the, the new like the new thing for me really. is like I was finding fulfillment up until a certain point building my own empire. And when I say empire, what I mean is I truly believe that with entrepreneurship, especially in the modern day, with the opportunities that we have, we as people, human beings, male and female, can build the life that they want to live. They just have to learn the skills to be able to apply it, to take action, to then build, go and build that empire. We can create our own businesses. We can create the businesses to live the life that we want. So obviously I came to Bulgaria thinking that this was an advantageous business move with regards to you know, employment, taxes, all that kind of stuff, and realized I actually love the place. So my thinking is, well, how can I build me being here more into my empire? Well, if I hire more people here and I buy a place here, I then build some more mentorship out here, I can now live this life as well as part of my work. Now I've built the lifestyle that I want to live. So I'm an engineer of my own life because I understand the skills and understand the rules of the game that I'm playing. So I'm a player, I can play the game. And I literally wake up every single day in a game world. Like I love myself, I pinch myself sometimes thinking how do I get so lucky to be able to do what I want when I want? It's because I built it. And that's entrepreneurship. You're like a modern day, modern day creator of your own destiny. And that's new. That is not something that people had 50 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, 20 years ago. We now can do that. I don't know how big this window is gonna be, this arbitrage that this may be afforded to, to some of us, this luxury that we've now got. Because probably people like us that help thousands, if not millions of people actually acquire these skills will make that more saturated and will make it harder to get that arbitrage from. So if you wanna get on it, now's the time to, to get moving and, and take advantage of this. You don't have to do what they tell you. You don't have to go and get a job. You don't have to leave the country. You can actually build a life that you want. And it's almost crazy to think about the things that people, if you try to explain to a 60 year old, 70 year old woman, what an influencer is, what would well, they say? If I count my parents, I mean. Yeah, they, I, they, I, they ask your parents really well, but They'd say, how the hell does someone making a video make money? That's not a job. That's not a real job. No, my they, parents understand really well. I was just saying that, <laughs> like, if you uh, if you ask any other 60, yeah. 70 year old, yeah, they don't they don't fully understand it. Although I think it's so big that nowadays even they understand how it goes. I think they admit that there's actually yeah. potentially the new era now yeah. is here, but they have no clue what it is, how it works, or the fact that that's even possible. They're baffled by the fact that there's. 13 year old millionaires out there making money streaming their gaming. That, that's incomprehensible to these people. The world is now shifted. But what that means is there's a window here where if you can adapt and learn these skills, you can build any kind of lifestyle that you want in any location that you want, in any way that you want. Because within reason, like you said, if providing the market's big enough and the service is good, you can sell anything. Most skills are now monetizable if you know how to do it. I think every skill is monetizable. I, I, I'm a sucker for a good biography. And I think from all the biographies that I've read, I'm coming under the impression that it's always been like that. It's just that social media now spotlights specific extreme outliers. And you think they're more common than, than uh, they were before. <laughs> yeah. But you just don't know history because no one, you know, wrote about all those great men that at age 18 they're you know self-made started working at 12 made like insane things in the us uk whatever everywhere around the world so it's always like do you have the capacity to work through it and do you have the agency to realize that it's within your reach it's under your control because you can always adopt the victimhood mentality like it's like the, the country needs to help me, like someone needs to save me, like whatever. Like, are you going to leave things in the hands of others or are you going to stand up and say no? And I think also what 
what made me and, and Stan coming back to, um, to, to what you asked previously, make the decision to throw it all away in terms of what others thought about this nowadays, I think very small investment because nowadays mm -hmm. most mentorship is way more expensive. Um, was exactly this, like we, we were always both of us disagreeable, uh, but in a nice way, because we didn't took what we were always told as, um, as necessarily true. I would always question things, like I would question social norms, I would question doing things in, in school that I thought were stupid and they were pointless. And I always wanted to, you know, be a trailblazer, like make, make mm -hmm. my own way. So I think that that helps a lot. And it's something that you, some people are born with. It's something some people acquire. I think it's a skill most of, uh, most of all. Uh, and I think that would be the, the most important thing in my opinion, just having understanding that you have the authorship, you have the agency to, I know it sounds corny and cheesy when I said from the side, but it, if you work hard, it's going to manifest itself because Obviously, there's people that they, they were at the right place at the right time. So you look at them, again, spotlight effect of social media and think, wow, it's so easy for them and it's going to be easy for me. No, you're going to be dealt a different hand, uh, hand of cards and it might be a very bad ha uh, set of, uh, of cards, right? But you need to keep playing the game and eventually you'll win. And also that comparison between the other people and yourself is really toxic because sometimes the the odds are going to be stacked against you 100 times in a row mm -hmm. and you just need to persevere so believing uh, as you also talked about belief system believing that that you have the authorship to make anything happen and just playing the game to continue playing the game like the infinite game mindset i think these are the two fundamental things on which everything else you built i think the other thing to realize as well is that People, especially, I'm going to speak to, to Bulgarians and, and maybe people in Romania because I spend a lot of time in both places. But Bulgarians that I've, I've run into use a lot of limiting beliefs in that mm. they believe that their country doesn't afford them the opportunities that are elsewhere. And you have to ask yourself the question, why the hell is Elliot Wise, a very successful entrepreneur, a millionaire from England, trying to set up shop in East Europe and in Bulgaria because the opportunity here is way bigger as far as I can see it. And the arbitrage here right now is enormous. And I'm telling you that from someone that's reading this from afar, I could be wrong, but I know I'm not. I know I'm not. Every sign and every single thing that I've seen here is telling me that there's more opportunity here than you could possibly fathom. So for people, Bulgarians sitting here thinking that, you know, I can't start a business because I didn't get an English education. I didn't have uh, the luxury of, you know, good parents or a good upbringing, whatever it may be. I, I don't have those things because society's told you that that's going to stop you is absolute bullshit because it is now actually in your favor because of the way things are moving, because of the way the economies here are definitely emerging whereas they've been emerged in America and the UK for the, the digital-based services, the econ-based services. It's prime here. It's about to explode. What do you see it, as the biggest signs? Because you mentioned some. What, what are the biggest signs that something's brewing up here? And where would you say is the opportunity? For so people? number one, the market has to be there. You, you alluded to this earlier. So if people aren't ready for a product or service, it doesn't matter how good it is, if the market isn't ready, it'll be declined. So this happens all the time. People come up with a great new piece of technology or a great piece of software. The market isn't quite ready to absorb it yet. So it never actually takes off. And then someone come to the exact same thing, carbon copy three years later and it'll fly, right? Yeah. That's happened over and over again. If you look at MySpace and Bebo pre-Facebook, same yeah. thing. The market wasn't quite ready, but those softwares were pretty much exactly the same. They just flopped because the market wasn't quite ready. It needed a bit of warming up. Everyone I'm speaking to, they're starting to use these things now. Everyone's on their mobile phone. The older generation asked, as you rightly said, now understand that this thing is here. They're starting to get a grasp of the fact that it's actually not necessarily the worst thing in the world to put their car details online, right? Yeah. right? That's a huge thing. I'm not putting my car details online. Yeah. Someone could steal it. What? Okay, so... All these things and preconceived notions that would have been blocking the access to this thing before 
starting to drop, COVID helped a lot. A lot more people had to go online and actually start using digital services. People are ordering food to their door a lot more. People are happier to start paying for things like mentorship and maybe fitness coaching, things like that. So the market's starting to pick up because people are actually more accepting of the service. So the market is opening its doors, number one. Number two, can people afford the service to actually help those people? Okay, so all the things I'm starting to see. Real estate here is on a very good upward trend. Coffee shops, luxury goods, people are actually out and about spending money on things that aren't necessity goods anymore. Especially in Bulgaria, because you've got a very concentrated amount of wealth that's been so fear. It's not the same necessarily for the outer areas, mm. but I also know a lot of foreign investors like myself bringing money here, which is also a very good sign. So if you've got a very good foreign investment, that's going to fuel tourism. It's going to fuel money being spent in bars and clubs and restaurants and supermarkets and real estate, which then therefore gives more money to give people more money to buy services online. So all of these things, and also the way the economy is going outside the global economy, you've got a lot of control and, and government control in a lot of other countries where, yes, you have issues here, there's a lot of corruption here and everything else, but it doesn't seem to be progressing at the rate of control with things like uh, digital currencies and stuff like that as fast as, like, there's still cash here. So it's, it's a little bit slower. So what I'm seeing is, is a market that's following a trend of the West very closely. <laughs> and I'm all about reading patterns. And if you, like you say, history repeats itself over and over again. There's a lot of very strong signs here. And the fact that I've also started building a market in Romania, and that's going really well already within this space. So analyzing everything from afar, we're on the brink of something pretty major. And you've got a load of people here that have got a point to prove. Yeah, there's a lot of people that will sit there and make excuses, but there's also a lot of young, hungry gold parents that I'm working with that have been the most ferocious motherfuckers that I've ever had the pleasure to deal with. They're a blessing to have in my business and they're fueling everything. And I'm thinking, well, if there's people out there willing to work like this, they're going to take the market. There's so much here that's so good. I wish people, Bulgarians, would stop putting themselves down and start actually seeing the opportunity and the positive things that are here. I love it. The culture's great. They still have, it is, and we talked about this before, there is a shift, there is being a little bit more of a shift, but traditional values here are still huge. Family unit's still huge. There's a lot of real traditional good things here that will build a great nation of people. And for me, that's as a business person, that's really good support for anyone that you're employing, for any businesses that you're going to put here, for any assets that you own here. Yes, it comes with a lot of negatives too. There's other issues here, of course, but there's in every country. But if you start looking at the positives that are here and you start working with those, man, it's exciting. It's a real exciting time. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. I see it. <laughs> These fuckers aren't going to take advantage of it. I will. But I want to help people here. So that's where, obviously, the mentorship and everything else has come on. And I want to employ more people here. I'm loving the fulfillment I'm getting. Like, when I help people here, it's really making an impact. When I help someone in the UK, yes, it's still fucking awesome. I still love it. But the gratitude isn't there. They don't seem to appreciate the opportunity they've got because they see everyone else doing it already or they've they've got a very comfortable life. Whereas I've got guys here that literally a few years ago still had toilets in the garden and like their parents would leave their house for a few months in the summer or the winter to go and make money somewhere else in another country. A bit, they're teenagers living at home trying to fend for themselves. That's not, I, I've never heard of that in the UK. So some people have lived here with real hardship and they want it. They're really hungry and they see the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it, it's helpful to have lived through a bit of a grind so that you're not scared of it. Mm -hmm. And you don't feel like everything is entitled. What do they say? Hard times make strong people, good times make weak people. And if you've been in a position where you've had a hard time, use that as fuel to build off of. Use that as an appreciation for the good that's gonna come and a motivator. So I see that as a massive positive and in the, the most respectful way possible, if you have had a hard life, the best thing you can do 
is use that for the fueling of the energy to actually improve yourself and now build a better one for you and your future to come and your family. That's why a lot of rags to riches stories are exactly that, rags to riches. Because they didn't have the, they had the drive built on the fact that they were intolerant of the position that they were in and they saw other people having the things that they know that they wanted. But now you can have it. Now the, the, the situation, the world that we live in has now afforded you that opportunity. And like you said, you can be a victim or you can see that and fucking hand. Yeah, it might mean that you have to really work to stand up and, and, and pull it and stand up. But the decision is now yours. And that's a scary thing for a lot of people. I, I, I agree. A lot of people are scared about fr from that. Also, like, it's going to come super easy to some people and it's going to be super hard for some other people. That's why I said I think perseverance is the one thing that people should get out of you know, That's life. this podcast. Yeah, it's life, yeah. Like, we're not all born 10 out of 10 best looking person on the planet or best with blessed with the best genetics in the world or the most intelligence or whatever whatever it is that you were born with someone else was born with something with it better and someone else was born with something worse most likely we're all human and we all come pre-made with a certain set of genetics that we then have to work with and you can sit there and cry about it or you can make out the most with what you've got because one thing is for sure we all end up in a box so you can spend this journey making excuses about why that guy had something you didn't and waste your entire life bitter and angry or crack the fuck on and build something better with what you do have. That's game theory. Pick one. You're going to end up the same place either way. I know that for me, I want to enjoy the thing as much as I humanly can. And me worrying about someone else and what they have that I didn't have is only going to detract from that. I don't want that. I don't want to be that bitter old 80-year-old 80, 80 man that's angry at life. That's why I deploy empathy. When people look at me and they, they criticize me or they, they, they bash me for certain things, I genuinely feel sorry for them. I'm very happy with my journey. I act in accordance with my ethics, my morals. I know that I'm trying to do the best for everyone and myself. And I'm happy with the things I do. It's not how much money makes how you make money. I sleep very well every single night knowing that I'm in line with what I want to do and I'm really proud of what I'm becoming. So if you try and sit there and bash me, the only person I'm sad for is you. Because that's obviously coming from a place of you not necessarily feeling like you've got something that I do. Well, when, rather than bash me, figure out how you can improve yourself and actually become the best you can be. Because that not only benefits you, then benefits everyone in your circle. Because if you not to do that, it's selfish. Like you as a man, if you've got dependents, you've got a wife, you've got a family, you sitting there bashing and moaning about other people is actually detracting from what you could provide them to, not just you. People just get so caught up in themselves and realize what they're not doing for others. Like, everything that you do has an impact not just to you, but everyone in your circle and everyone that's around you, positive and negative. So every time you fucking sit there and moan and you don't improve yourself, that's also hurting them. You're also depriving them of something that you could bring. And I think, you your family, man? Yes. Here's the <laughs> ring, man. Exactly. <laughs> right here. I thought I'd ask just so that, yeah. obviously, I know you are. And... That has a huge impact. So everything you do, and I said this at the beginning of the podcast, when you're in your 20s and you, or whatever age and you don't have dependence, you can get away with a lot more. Now, every single decision I make, I have to take into account my staff, my wife, my kids, my parents, my wife's parents, my brother, his wife, his kids, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and then all of my cousins, anyone else that's like immediately involved with the family everyone is now being impacted by my decisions. That's powerful. And I also know that if I'm negative, that comes with negative consequences as well. So not only am I gonna have a shit life if I sit there comparing against other people and complaining about it, I'm also gonna make a shit life for everyone else. And also you're a horrible bastard, so no one wants to be around you. That's not good either. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think um, some people see it as, as a bit uh, a bit narcissistic or too self-inflated to assume responsibility for everyone. Like they would say, oh, they're old, you know, not old, sorry, but um, they're adults, they can take care of themselves, whatever. But I think there's also, it come, it gives a lot of power to assume responsibility, even though those people don't necessarily need you 
to uh, take care of everything for them. But just having the mindset of, oh, I need to take care of my uh, parents-in-law, I need to care, uh, take care of my parents and, you know, my wife and her sister and my sister and whatever. Just being r ready for the absolute worst case scenario and just being rising to the best version of yourself you can be so that if something happens by chance, they can actually lean on you for support. I think that just brings out the best of you. So I don't see it as narcissistic or self-inflated, but a lot of people do. Let me rephrase that because you just made a very powerful point. There's been a lot of people and there's one guy in particular that's been kind of famed for having a particular ideology behind taking accountability for people around him. Um, he's actually in Romania. Okay. We know who we're talking about, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's the way he actually phrases it. So let me rephrase this. My wife absolutely does not need my help. She was perfectly fine before I came along. She's an independent, strong woman. My kids would be absolutely fine without me in the picture. I'm convinced of it because she's strong. Her, my in-laws are fucking brilliant. They support us with everything. So is my family. They're great. They don't need me. However, I want to be the provider and I want to help support them. And if the, 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 the alternative is being someone that's a victim that doesn't try and become better, that doesn't improve their life, when I can, I'm a failure. And although they don't need it, I'm a fucking letdown. And I think that's how men should look at it, is that people don't need you, motherfucker. That is a bit arrogant and self-inflated. But why not give it to them if you can? Yeah. Why not? Why not be the supportive husband? Why not be supportive with the cash? flow and, and actually supporting them financially and being there as a rock emotionally physically being a good leader for your kids yeah they don't need it they'd be fine without you but if you can do it then why the fuck can't you you're either lazy or you're too wrapped up in your own issues of, of, of why you can't do things in the victim mindset so i think if it was reworded in a different way and people saw it the way i do my wife reminds me all the time she doesn't need me she likes to tell me that all the time i don't fucking need you you go do your own thing but I want to do that. Like, I don't need to dress up well for my wife. I don't need to do my hair. I want to because I want to look nice for her. I want to be that support. And she appreciates it. She doesn't need it. That's powerful. And as a man, as someone that's a self-respecting adult, especially with kids as well, that's a good leader. Do you want your kids to act like that? I do. They don't need it. They don't need it. But you, I, in my opinion, should definitely be doing it if you can. Yeah. I mean, need in the sense of like <laughs> need to survive, yeah. obviously, but the, their lives will be better if you are better. They will be better, of yeah. course. So like that, that's also not a takeaway. And as Stan, who usually sits across me, he always says, I prefer to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. It's kind of like that's his analogy mm. of what we were uh, just talking about. So let's get back because I'm curious and uh, we obviously talk about what you do here and as far as I understand in Romania, but you, you said you started the real estate uh, business um, up from where your life used to, wife uh, used to live back then. So what did you transition next into? Because as far as I can understand, you also are still doing the marketing agency mm -hmm. and you also invested in real estate. Uh, and did you jump immediately to doing mentorship with for other businesses or do you do something else? No, so... Obviously, the marketing agency, everything was going really well. Um, my wife finished her medical degree, so she became a doctor, and we were hit with the decision of, do we stay up north, in the north of England? Because um, we, we built a bit of a life up there at that point. We were going to go to Cheshire, which is a really nice part mm -hmm. of the world, and live in the countryside. I love the country. Or do we go back down south, where our family and our initial contract, our contacts are, our friends are, everything down there? And at this point, we didn't have any kids, and we kind of ummed and ahed about it. And we were both pretty big workers, right? She's going to go off and be a full-time doctor. I'm out juggling multiple businesses and, you know, what it's like being a 24-7 entrepreneur. We knew that we would have kids. My wife's Iranian as well, so she's a big family unit, um, loves loves family, wanted kids. We both wanted kids. Um, and we were thinking, okay, we're going to get married and have kids. Where do we want to be? So we decided to move back down south. Um, and that was purely for the fact that we'd have a bit more parental support. We'd have more people around us so that we could both continue without having to sacrifice too much of what we were doing commercially and make sure that we knew that 
if we were to get parental support, it'd be from people that had our ethics and morals because it'd be more family-based rather than an independent party coming in trying to help us because we could get babysitters and stuff. That was just a personal choice that we wanted. So we decided to move back down south. I bought another place down there, bigger, ready for the incoming bigger family. And my wife, having done her medical degree, was obviously a doctor, but she loved running her own businesses too. And I realized that it was becoming very negative, uh, her mindset, because the NHS, which is the National Health yeah. Service in the UK, they pay crap money for doctors. I mean, it's, it's less than minimum wage for a fully trained doctor. It's horrendous. So we'll put it this way. Her paycheck to drive, she, this time she was driving a G-Wagon to, to work, <laughs> right? Her paycheck to cover, the, would just about cover her fuel and maintenance of her car to and from work every month. That's just how ridiculously low her paycheck was. I mean, it's very low. So that's okay because obviously the financial support wasn't necessarily needed, but it was annoying her because she's always used to earning more. She's always had her own little businesses and always done uh, done well for herself. So she wanted to get into aesthetics, which is like lip fillers, Botox, mm. et cetera. And the, the market's very saturated in the UK. But I said to her, look, I think it'd be really nice. And something that I've I've found with relationships and I've been married now, just had our fifth year anniversary, five years, is that if either party doesn't have something that they generate fulfillment from, it doesn't necessarily have to be financial, mm -hmm. but something that they have, that they can be prideful of, that they can work towards, that they can build outside of your relationship, I've found it can be the case that it can become very poisonous in a relationship because one person is then solely reliant on your attention and focus to fulfill them. And not through fault of their own, can then end up becoming quite toxic because if you're not able to provide that for them, they can become resentful of that and vice versa because then there becomes this horrible toxicity and poison that starts to emerge within the relationship. So what I've always found to be better is, I was never one of these men that was like, my wife should never work, this and that. Although I have traditional values, I wanted my wife to have something that she could be prideful of. Also, I also knew as well that humans are human, right? She doesn't know what's gonna happen in her life. And I think it's also very important for women, if you are the main breadwinner and you are providing people or your family financially, to make them feel secure. Because what a lot of men do, and I think this is a massive mistake, is they will provide for them financially, but then also say, well, I'm holding all of the cards. If something were to happen, you're fucked. How do you think that makes them feel? You have then arrogantly taken all the power, and that's very controlling, making them feel completely dependent on you. That's emotional manipulation to me. So what I'd rather do is say, look, I'm more than happy to provide for you, but I'm either gonna give you a safety net or even put a separate bank account with your name on it that I can't have access to so that, especially when you have kids, that anxiety increases as well. If anything were to happen or whatever, you're actually be fine. Or in her case, let's build you an income so that you know you're always secure no matter what. And I promise you guys, if you do that, your relationship will be better than ever and the, the unspeakable of those things actually happening where you break up won't occur anywhere near as more as frequently because you don't have all the splinters and the pressure in the relationship in the first place. So what I did with her was, is I said, right, okay, I'll help you build your business. I'll get you get the marketing running and everything set up. We'll run it from the house. And then once it's running, you can take over and run it. If you need my help, you can have it. If not, that's your thing. Then that's your thing. You can call your own. It's a focus outside of me. Doesn't mean that my full attention needs to be on you and you're not solely deriving your happiness based on me. So we built her an aesthetics business. It's now absolutely enormous. It's huge. Um, and she does extremely well out of that. And the great thing is, she always wanted to be a doctor and she always wanted to help people. And the problem was she was becoming negative about it because she was associating her wage with the service that she mm. was providing Risk now. Value. What I said to her was, reframe that. Now go to the hospital knowing that you're not there for money, you're there just to help people. And the money is irrelevant because you make that in your business. So you're there just doing good work. Think about it more charitable and philanthropically. And that way, when you're there, she wants to be there because she wants to help people and there's no money attached to it. So we took that money element out and now she absolutely adores helping people. And I think would we'll probably admit she's a better doctor because of it and has a lovely business on the side, which gives her security, gives her focus. And we have a way better relationship because of it. So to cut a long story short, we have the aesthetics business now. And then this was, uh, this was really kicking off pre-COVID. 
actually before lockdowns and the mentorship came around that time so I had a few people in the, the fitness industry that I had the, the marketing agency but I'd never done consultation work mm -hmm. which is what kind of mentorship is it's not done for you so an agency would go in the difference between agencies an agency will go in and just build out everything for you they'll build your landing pages they'll create your content they'll market for you and they'll run it whereas mentorship is more I will you come under as an apprentice you go away and do it and I'll help you work through it and I'll give you advice and the tools that are needed but ultimately you're the one that's going to be doing it right you're doing it for yourself with my advice and my experience. It's a done with you. Setup. Done with you. Done with you setup, exactly. And I had a few people ask me pre-COVID, we didn't know this shit was coming, obviously. <laughs> and uh, I took a couple of guys on the fitness industry that I knew very well. Which ones um, are you allowed to say? Yeah, so I was working, well, I had a good experience with a guy called Jordan Peters, who's a massive oh, yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah, he's, he's awesome, man. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. I then had a guy called Jace Long, who's, um, he was a very successful coach in the UK. I got a guy called Steve Steve Phillips, uh, Cam McKay. So there's they're probably more known in the UK as well. Yeah. They're now much bigger coaches. But I had a guy called James Cooper as well, who mm. owned a gym in London. He was actually the first guy that came to me properly for mentorship. And I think we like we ten xed him in like three weeks as well. By the end of the year, he had <laughs> he's he was working in a gym. By the end of the, the, the year, he had his own gym, multiple people, he had online coaching, he had staff, the whole lot. And cut long story short, started with a few of those and they were very, they're very well known. And, and because of that, word gets around. Lockdown hit. And my marketing agency got absolutely slammed. I was marketing for Harrods. So I was marketing for some other really big gym manufacturing companies. We were talking huge retainers. I had my whole team working on them. And I had to make the decision, even though they were contracted a lot of my clients to say that I'm not gonna charge you when your doors aren't physically open. I can't morally take your money when I know you can't sell anything. My job as a marketing agency is obsolete. But I turn around, well, I've got all these staff to pay. How many people did you have back then? I think in that agency there was 15 people that were in that staff, yeah. uh, staffing. So you can imagine the wage bill is pretty high. Yeah, just the payroll is probably the payroll six is figures huge. per month. So what I've always done with my businesses is I'll always keep six months worth of cash flow to cover payroll so and operating costs. So if no money comes in, we've got at least six months covered. So I wasn't feeling particularly worried because lockdown was only going to last a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> so i'd already had the conversation with the bloody companies as well that obviously if this thing prolongs uh, well obviously lockdowns happened i'm not going to charge you don't worry about it i didn't actually stupidly put into place that if it carries on it would be nice to at least get a small percentage potentially of the retainer to cover my costs so that we don't go bang while we're shut didn't do that so then I was, I turned around and was like, well, I've got these mouths to feed, fine. I'm not going to take any business bounce back loans or any of that crap from the government. I'm just going to pay for it myself. I didn't take any penny from the government because that's just was what I decided to do. And quite quickly realized that two weeks turned to three, three weeks turned to four. We had like a week open and then we shut back down again. I thought, oh shit, I'm in real trouble. Like I thought the cash is wearing down very quickly. The payroll is going out. Everyone's worried. I'm getting a lot of pressure on me. My family's worried. So I'm thinking, well, if I need to support my other, my family members that might go bang as well. I phoned up my whole family at the time and said, look, my, I spoke my brother up. I've got a younger brother. I said, look, if, you, if you, you you lose your job, don't worry about it. I'll cover your mortgage. I phoned my parents up. Look, if you can't pay your rent or whatever, I'll, I'll cover it. And just make sure everyone felt secure. So mm. I didn't have to do that. I just felt like I wanted to do that. And that obviously had a tremendous amount of pressure to me. So I was like, shit. Pressure's good though. Pressure's good. I work very well under pressure. So I was like, shit, I've got to sort this out. Otherwise I'm going to go bang. I remember this the first time I sat there in my life and was like, right, I made sure everyone else is okay. Oh, who do I ask? Because I need, you know, I always have that plan B hmm. I told you about. I didn't have one for this instance. I sat there thinking, oh, I am the safety net. What if that safety net breaks? There's no net underneath that one. Okay, there's nothing to do but to figure this shit out. Nothing to do but to figure this shit out. So I thought, I said to my wife, I said, right, we're going to mentorship. She went, what? What's that? She didn't really know, 100%. Because I said, well, I've been consulting these businesses and it's working really well. The way I see it, the fitness coaching space is going to go huge right now. 
online because I was like, loads of people are going to be stir crazy indoors, wanting to actually still stay in shape and do stuff. She went, no one's going to pay for that, Elliot. No one, no one wants mentorship and no one really does online coaching. I was like, yeah, they do. Watch. She went, okay, fine. <laughs> it's the one thing she'll always sit there because she, she, I, I remind her that every single time because her doubt actually, it's the first time she's ever doubted me. It fueled, I had no other choice either. Mm. I said, it fueled my, my drive. And uh, so I basically went on my Instagram and said, right, look, coaching is about to get massive online. I'm going to work with that generic. I literally was like, all right, let me take five people on. My message box went mad because obviously I'd already got quite well known and I'd never done anything personally before, like openly personally. And I was like, okay. Then I charged a silly, silly low fee. I'm not going to say how low it was. And I decided to do a call a week as well with these people. I set up a task board so that she went and built. And all these people, a lot of them were starting up businesses from scratch as well. As you know, starting up a business from scratch is normally a lot harder than actually taking a business that's doing okay and then oh, scaling it, right? I think zero to two K is like the hardest. Oh, it's the hardest, man. So that yeah. a lot of them are in that stage. Some of them were way above and that's where I was getting people going from like 10K a month up to 25K in a matter of a month or two. And that was fueling the rest of it. So at one point, I had all these, t- I was, and I didn't have any stuff, I was doing it on my own, decided to do it mm-hmm. on my own. I had, I think I remember I had 76 clients I was doing one call a week with, personally. Personal. Zoom, not over yeah. the phone. Plus taking all the sales calls, I decided to do Zoom sales calls as well. F- for the incoming For people. the incoming people. Yeah. Plus making content. So the one thing I did have is I had my videographer coming over mm. and I was trying to film YouTube videos and, and support videos so that I didn't have to keep answering so many FA, like frequently asked questions. Because so I had no course material at this point. I had nothing to give people. It was just me. So then when it's fully reliant on me when I was saying the same thing a hundred times over, I was like, well, I need to start recording this stuff. <laughs> so I was doing that. I was helping people like on WhatsApp too. So I gave them WhatsApp mm. support, putting all their task boards in, creating PDF documents and support documents, reviewing all of their their content and the material they were putting up. And basically, I did that for the best part of lockdown. I was doing, you know, you talked about 16 hour days will ruin you. Yeah. Monday through to Sunday, that was what I was doing. Yeah, because like, that, that, like, that's a lot of work. I was chain that's calling. Zoom calls back to back yeah. are like, if you have you ever done, I don't know if people have done this. I remember I did 17 Zoom calls without a break. My wife came in, I was pretty much there, was shaking. <laughs> she was bringing me coffees in between. I was ruined. I remember getting to the last call. And I was like, I don't even know where I am. I could barely, I was not coherent. I could barely even talk. I was like, this is going to kill me. But I paid for everything. And in that, realized that I'd created a new business, which I only was going to use temporarily to cover the bills until we got out. I was like, this shit's insane. I've helped so many people make money. And this is like a crazy, crazy good service. I basically built a new system where it's probably not new now, but what I initially did was when I started up the mentorship was I phoned every single person I knew that ever had mentorship before, every single one. And I said, tell me everything you loved about it, everything you hate about it. Have you got any documents on it? Have you still got the logins for it? I went through every single thing and I basically mapped out what I thought would be a perfect way to mentor, added my own thoughts into it. And then just built that system out. So I have tasks that people will follow on a day to day basis, take them off, it's like the way the support was done. And I was like, this is actually really, really good business model. And you know what? As much as it killed me, I had people phoning me up crying that they could actually go to the supermarket and buy something without looking at the price tag for the first time in their life. I'd gone from working with massive corporates where if I made them an extra 10 mil that year, I'd get a thank you and maybe a bottle of wine at the Christmas and then set increase my target for the next year. <laughs> right? <laughs> Literally, that's pretty pretty much it. I might get invited I might get invited to the Christmas party to actually having an impact on someone who is supporting a young family or has never had a good life. And I was like, this is what I want to do more of. I love it. I can't carry on the way I am because I'll die before I actually help some more people, but I really want to do some, I really want to do some more good in this space. So plus it's not as monotonous, right? No, because working with big companies, you have all these bureaucracy stuff going on. Like you need seven levels of approval to launch a marketing. Uh, it's horrendous. I'd sit down with a board of people and then yeah. I'd have to, then someone wouldn't be at the meeting and then you'd have to go and have a meeting with them after. And then, then I'd have to go off to get approved by someone else. And then someone else have an, have the arse ache because you've said something that went against what mm-hmm. they said and everyone's competing for power. And it was horrendous. It was difficult, especially when you're a third party plug-in like I was. Yeah. I was an independent agency, not in the company. So everyone felt really threatened by you when you went in and were trying to do work for them. 
and uh, I still do when I get I do that, but it, it's not it's not easy. So yeah, the the, the mentorship's amazing. I'm, uh, you probably get the same feeling when you coach people, right? And you change yeah. their life and their confidence, and that's on a one to one level. I think unbeatable. It was close to what I felt like my wife gets when she goes to the hospital to, and she saves someone's life. And I'm not comparing it by any means. But this is something I always say to her. I wish that I could have more impact like you do on that level where you're actually saving people's lives. Hmm. This is as close as I can get to that. So I would say it might be the same. In, it in is not sense. as direct. But, you know, bad things usually happen all of a sudden and good things usually are cumulative. Yes. So it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's not the same. Like you, you can't. It's not as direct. It. No. Yeah. So yeah. It, you can't compare. It's apples and oranges. And I said you shouldn't compare. Yeah. But it was something that gave me a lot of fulfillment and purpose. And that's why I, was, I remodeled it and created mm -hmm. the, the university. And I want to do a lot more of that. Yeah. And what I saw from the website is like you did, um, you know, you have people in certain niches and you pretty much develop like a network of mentors that you can, you know, work with depending on your niche so aesthetics obviously i thought why the aesthetics is there because it seemed a bit odd among mm -hmm. the, the real estate construction and everything else but now it makes a lot more sense after the podcast but you know construction real estate aesthetics uh i forgot the rest yes e e e sorry, e fitness coaches yeah um sales itself yeah. and the, the the reason that i feel that the traditional academic system is is now flawed it wasn't so bad 50 years ago, but the world has now changed as we've just pointed out in this mm -hmm. podcast. The way to make money and the way to actually get by in this new phase is completely different. And if you go and learn from someone that has never actually had any experience with these new wealth creation techniques, these new ways of actually building an empire, then you're gonna be beholden to the old tech when you're competing against everyone else that's arbitraging the new. We haven't even talked about artificial intelligence yet and all the stuff that's coming with that. So the way I saw it was, well, initially I'm just gonna mentor people and obviously the things that I know and I've done myself. And we used his name before, Hormozy talks about this. If you're gonna educate people, educate them on the things that you've done and you know. So for example, if you have got yourself into ridiculous shape, talk about that. Don't talk about contest prep and don't talk about biomechanics and things that you've never actually done yourself. Just stay in your own lane. And that's okay, because there is still a market for that. As soon as you start to swerve out into all these different areas that you've listened to someone else say and you're trying to regurgitate their crap, you'll get called out pretty quickly. And secondly, you're being a scam artist, <laughs> all right? So what I did was, is, okay, I'll help people in the remits and the things that I have done and show them the path that I have walked. Nothing more, nothing less. And then what I, could do is bring other people on that have walked these paths further, that have done bigger things in these industries, and then use them to mentor people so that they can help people get further. And if I can build this out, I build the framework and the infrastructure for an amazing educational platform and something that people can go and actually get to where they're trying to go from people that have actually done it and still doing it. And this is something you talked about as well, is we now live in a world that things move so fast. so you need to be being taught by someone that's still relevant because last year, some of the marketing methods that you used to build your coaching business won't work today. You have to be what's, what's on the money right now and also what's the new arbitrages. Yeah. Artificial intelligence, can I be doing my copywriting, my graphic design, my videography soon with all this stuff? Yeah, probably. Can I be chopping up some of my short form content with some of this stuff? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You've got a whole host of tools now available that if you're not learning those things, you're left behind and you're gonna be very, very much behind the pack and gonna miss that that window. Yeah, I think, because uh, for example, I studied finance and investments. That was my, my master's oh, did you? degree. Yeah, yeah, I did. But I mean, <laughs> can't invest if, if I need to save my life. Uh, but still, like I feel like university education is great for stuff that is finite and regulated well finite to an extent right like stem stem yeah. uh, or you know getting a medical degree or a psychology but for i could, i never as a person who i would say i understand marketing I could, i'm not a marketer i'm entrepreneur first and foremost but i understand marketing right i don't understand a, a bachelor degree in marketing 
Like it makes zero sense to me. It's like it should be three to six months of, you know, studying certain things and then you should, you know, get an apprenticeship and then or mm-hmm. an internship and then, you know, specialize. And obviously at some point you want to become full stack if you want to or, you know, become a deep specialist in some in some space. But like three years of marketing or four years of marketing is like it's nothing. You just don't learn learning anything, you're just wasting your time. I think if you're a Bulgarian and you're thinking about getting into something, you've got a couple of options. Number one, you can pay a mentor to expedite your journey to that thing. You can pay for the skill acquisition and you can get started and create wisdom through that. Mm. But that requires money and investment. The second option you've got is get a job that's going to pay you some sort of money so you can start saving up for mentorship. And in the meantime, try and get some work for free in a business that's doing the thing that you're trying to do. So you can actually get skill acquisition while free working, funding yourself with your job. But either way, you've got to pay. Hmm. And that's the, the, the two best methods for any Bulgarian, a young Bulgarian that's actually looking to get into any form of skill acquisition or new business. Also, we have a third method because now there's uh, a program called Mentor the Young. Mm-hmm. It's in Bulgaria where they pair uh, mentors who are usually people that are successful in the industry with young people who want to learn and you can really get a great mentor for free for like three four months they you know they give you a lot of value so it's it's cool that we have that it's great and i think the uh, one one thing to add into that that mix is is networking yeah is get on chat rooms get on forums go to events physical events get and even if they're not in your same country as you there's still a lot of people out there doing these things and they don't they don't cost you to be a part of those things like you said, mental the young. It sounds absolutely brilliant. If you can find anywhere online, there's Facebook groups, there's Discord chats, there's all these different places, Reddit forums, where people are just like you in the same place in your journey. And that's powerful. You combine that with those things and that's the fastest way anyone can start getting to where they want to go. But there has to be an element of time and monetary sacrifice, direct or indirect. But it, it, it's, it's an awesome world, man. It's, yeah. it's a so, I'm so blessed. I'm so happy to have been born in this period like how cool is that yeah it's because i think most people think that if they were born in like the the middle ages or like you know 17th 18th century they would be really well off like an aristocrat but chances are you probably would have been like a a peasant and you know cleaning big shit all day sorry for the expression stuff like that so i one thing i can promise you categorically and i'd bet my life on it if i picked any period in history and I went and picked one random person off the street or in a camp or in a cave, whatever the period, and I asked them, do you think you live in the best time ever? Every single one of them within reason would probably say, now it'd be better when if I lived back then when they had this or when I had this. There is an excuse in every, every single generation. What they're not doing is looking for the opportunities that they have right now just change the fucking script because you can't change when you were born or you can speak your parents as they say you can't change either of those but what you can do is work with everything you do have mm. but one thing i can also say is categorically we have lived in living in right now the best period in history for opportunity without a doubt so anyone listening to this that is not an excuse especially if you're in bulgaria you were born in the right place at the right time, which is very, very, very lucky for you. And people who listen to this podcast can choose to do with it whatever they wish. There'll be a load of people that come off here feeling pissed off at me because I've said that because now they have to now the admit to themselves though. that actually I have to do something about it. Yeah. Or if you find yourself thinking, Elliot's this, Elliot's that, he's making excuses for this, listen to the conversation you're having with yourself. Is that really me or is that you? Yeah, it helps to record yourself speaking it out loud. Say it out loud. Say all the thoughts you have about me, about the things that I'm saying about you and the opportunity you have and the conversation you have about me or that opportunity after and figure out whether it's you that's a problem or it's me. Yeah, that usually helps. <laughs> you know, I had, uh, I, I was exactly the opposite of what you would think when I was younger, like zero accountability, taking zero responsibility for my life. I was like, in the victim mentality uh, all the time. And 
I didn't record it and say it out loud. Back then, I didn't. I don't think I had. Oh no, I did have an iPhone, but it doesn't matter. Like that was way back. Uh, but I was alone with my thoughts for so long mm -hmm. when I was in the Netherlands that eventually the thoughts were as if I were speaking out loud. I could zoom out and see myself from the side. I'm like, okay, so you want a good life, but you're not willing to do anything about it. And every everything is someone else's fault. That That's not going to fly, man. Like, you need to change yourself. And that was like a wake-up call for me. When was that for you? When I was 21. And what pain were you going through that made you realize that? Um, let's say pain is, you know, something subjective because obviously I can't experience your pain and you might pain. So for me, it was a lot because back then that was the biggest issue I ever got. So, I mean, obviously it's the most you've experienced, but it was like, I, I was a total loser. That was it. Like not doing well academically. Although back then I think I was already on an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. Um, no, no social interactions whatsoever. I, I was a bit isolated. Didn't have, that much friend that, that many friends in the netherlands if any you know friends in the real sense where you spend a lot of time together and um all my friends here they already had you know their life going on so obviously skyping or whatever <laughs> yeah. i couldn't do that because they were already working and studying and like they didn't care about me and they shouldn't have i mean they had their own life to live so i was like alone and you know trying to figure out why i'm so unhappy and trying to find my purpose as well, like the meaning in life. The reason I asked, because yeah. I knew there would have been a pain that was the pivoting point, because humans will only ever take action if the pain of change is less than the pain of remaining the same. If people don't have enough pain, they won't change. And that's the other thing. A lot of people are going to be listening to this saying, well, you know, I want to change, I want to do this, I want to get into shape, I want to earn more money. And they make an effort, which they then give up very quickly because the pain of that sacrifice to actually achieve those things is actually more than just staying where they're at. And you need to have the honest conversation with yourself because you're going to be in perpetual turmoil, kidding yourself that you're in a lot of pain right now when you're really not and it's just something you think that you want. But if you have true pain, action on it as you did, you found a way, no matter what it took. And in those moments, they're, they're absolutely amazing. I love it when people have those light bulb moments because everything then just shifts after that point. It's literally like, you re but you remember the point where you're like, this is just, oh yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is gonna change. This is gonna change. This and that was a personal to, decision. This has to change. Like that's different. Change the that's word. exactly like the point. But when you say this has to change, is like where, Things start going on. And if you track back to that, no one else did anything for you. No one else, no opportunity, extra opportunity opened up. It, all it was was a matter of you deciding that I am no longer willing to tolerate the position that I am in and I have to, no matter what, change it. And you did. That's powerful. And if we could just hammer that into every single person on the planet, Everyone would have a better life. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen. It's hard. That's why I try to uh, say in this podcast and, you know, um, maybe being a bit of a contrarian to say that it, it, it is hard. Like, because a lot of gurus, when they sell, they focus on how easy it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact that it's going to be easy for some people and extremely hard for other people. And I try to hammer in the home, home the message that, you know, it's probably going to be hard. Just assume it's going to suck. And then if it's, you know, better than you expected, then you win. But, uh, but just assume it's going to be hard because it is. If it was that easy, everyone, everyone would have done it already. But that's it. So you have to weigh up. Okay. There's a price to pay for everything in life. Hmm. So there's a price to pay of remaining unhappy. There's also a price to pay to become more successful and change. Now you have to weigh up. Which one am I willing to pay for? Because if the price of changing and, like you say, if that's if it's too hard, people won't pay it because it's less pay, it's less costly or than it is. I try to, to wake them up to a different reality. Maybe they like their their problems more than they think they do. <laughs> Have you thought about that? Because obviously, like if you want a better life, 
it means there's a lack. You lack money, you lack finances, you lack the, the good body, you, lo- you lack something, right? Because when there's desire, there's lack. But also, like, those problems, they're giving something to you. It's not like they're just, pro- they're, they're just um, uh, nuisances. It's just like they're giving you something, right? So let's take an example of someone who's not happy with their financial mm-hmm. uh, st- status. Like, you're not working because you may be watching Netflix and you're scro- scrolling on your phone, whatever. And you want, you know, more money, you know, better job, business, whatever, but you're still doing this. And it's because it's giving you comfort. So the person who wants to get in shape, what's the problem they have? No, they can't stick to a routine because they like to be comfortable and, you know, avoid the pain. Or they like, you know, certain types of food way too much. Or if it's a person who whatever, just imagine a situation they're in and imagine their unwillingness to change and their problems. And usually what I tell them, like, you like your problems way much more than you think. You just don't want to admit it because it sounds it sounds bad to say I like smoking so much. Right. But that's why you're not quitting, because you like what the problem is giving. you. It's giving you the comfort. It's giving you whatever it is that, that is that it is like mm-hmm. immediate gratification. It's a nice way of framing it. Yeah. Because it gets people going. (laughs) With fitness, especially nowadays, like um, people trust us, but they don't trust themselves. And they don't trust themselves because deep down inside, they know that they actually like a lot of the stuff that they do have to let go. So I try to frame it like, okay, you like your problems way too much. Call me when... You hate those problems and you want them to go away. Because if I put put a gun to uh, to the head of whoever, just go. Let's go outside. And if I tell them like I'm gonna follow you for two months, and if you don't lose ten kilos, I'm gonna shoot you in the head. They're gonna lose to to t- ten kilos. I don't need to tell them what to eat. I don't need to tell them how to lift weights. And you can make the same argument about you know making money. If I have the gun to your head, you're gonna make money. You might not do it in the smartest pos- way possible, but you're actually going to do it because otherwise I'm going to shoot you and you're going to figure out the way to, you know, you're going to hustle it out, right? So if I don't have the gun to your head, then your problems are way stronger. Like what they're giving you is way stronger than your motivation to change. What would you say? Because you've yeah. lived in the Netherlands. Have you lived in any other countries? Uh, f- for very little. Okay. So what would you say that Bulgarians specifically have that are unique objections or hurdles they put in front of themselves potentially that you I haven't seen in other places? I the same thing. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I know what it is, but I would, I would have liked to hear your perspective on it. So from what I've seen in Bulgaria, I think one of the biggest issues is the older generations giving belief systems and advice to younger generations that is no longer relevant to their lives anymore. And that's not their fault. They haven't come from a time where they actually could use the tools that they now have. But like I said before, it's like trying to get you to get a horse and plow to go and see the field when there's a tractor next door. But your parents just didn't understand how to use the tractor. So they didn't teach you that and didn't tell you or push you towards it because it scared them. And we're in this position right now where people are making excuses for where they're at because they have a belief system that they're not able to have access to these things that are actually here. And I think there's a whole culture of this victim mindset that we are the little guy, that we weren't afforded the same opportunities, that we have to leave. That's the thing that breaks my heart the most is that I think that so many people and Bulgarians in particular are so patriotic and I love that about Bulgarians like one of the first gifts I was given was a history on Bulgaria I was then given a portrait by Zielowski (laughs) I've got one in my apartment and these are young kids sending me this stuff they're so patriotic about their country yet they're trying to do everything they can to leave I'm like holy shit why and I sit there and chat to them and they have this belief system that's completely false that there is no opportunity here that the money's in the west there's no market here no one's got any money here Money is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's been printed by the banks at a click of a button. There's no shortage of money. 
there's a shortage of mindset and understanding and unwillingness to see the opportunity and listening to advice from people that have no clue about today. That's dangerous to them and it's stopping them from expanding and becoming what they could be. So the, the biggest issue is learned helplessness because most people, they've been beat down so much and it's, it's a generational thing, mm -hmm. right? All the, the way through from communism to socialism that they've, they've now inherited this learned helplessness. Like you can't do nothing. The, the, everything's rigged against you, so just don't even try. So that's the first thing because it kills everything else. And then I would say the second biggest um, thing is just like the culture is such that people try to put you down way more than they try to elevate you, others. So people here are really doubtful and they're self-limiting, as you mentioned which if you combine those two, it's very hard to escape from victimhood uh, mentality and from, you know, being chronically unhappy. You know, there, there's this thing called Balkan syndrome because I think Moldova is the, the least happy country in the world and then Bulgaria is second or it was the other way around. It doesn't matter, but like people in the Balkans are very unhappy relative to, you know, where the, like the objective measures of well-being. It doesn't make sense. That's why it's called Balkan syndrome. No. So I think it's a combination of these two things. And we just need more trailblazers here, like better role models to show us what's possible. Like one of our friends, he's an, he's an, probably one of the best marketers in the world, to be honest. He's a Bulgarian dude. Uh, he came here some time ago to make a podcast uh, about... Um, his mentorship program mm -hmm. and more, most importantly how he managed to achieve what he did which is he did a bit over half a million in one day because he sold on his event like his mentorship program and i'm pretty sure he's going to come here again because this year on his event he made 1.2 million Damn. on his event and the reason why i'm saying this is not to glaze him up, but to say something else that happened adjacently. And that was like, first of all, conversion rate is crazy. Like he, like 20% conversion rate of the audience, thousand people. I mean, it's, it's hard to do even in the West, even like top marketers have a hard time doing this, but like a few other people in our social circle that are marketers that are, you know, business guys are like, wow, he's, he crushed it so hard. He threw the ball so far out of the park that now I'm setting higher um, targets, you know. I I'm going to set my aim higher because if he did it, then I can do it as well. So he kind of broke the four-minute mile for marketers and business owners here in Bulgaria. And obviously, he gets a lot of hate, but I respect him um, quite a lot because if he wasn't there to, you know, show the way to the other people, like just you know, pave through the, you know, uh, pave through the way, then they wouldn't have been um, um, as ambitious as they are right now. So imagine if you have 5,000 of those guys. Because then there's, you know, the, the startup ecosystem is, is strong here. Like we recently had our first official unicorn startup company. And there's like a few others that might uh, get to unicorn status soon. And there's a lot of smart people that are, you know, trailblazing internationally, bringing the knowledge back, how to manage big teams, how to, you know, secure investments, whatever. So imagine if we start doing it with, you know, e-com or services or whatever. It's, it's what you said. Like, there's a lot of hungry dudes out here. They want to prove a point. Uh, they're not afraid to, you know, of working. And they have, um, they have, they have, a healthy amount of ambition, like not unreasonable, but healthy amount of ambition. Like they're, they're currently centered because some of them are delusional, but they're currently <laughs> centered. So this is going to be very hard to reconcile for people that are in the state of learned helplessness, because if you can excuse your way um, in a conversation with one of your friends who's successful. You say, okay, he had, 
you know, wealthy parents or he did this or he had that. But when it's everyone around you, then it starts to become a problem. And when you, you're faced with such a decision, you either have to accept your utter incompetence or you have to accept that you failed yourself. But that comes with the flip side of you can, you know, build yourself up. That's the breaking point. The really important thing to remember as well is if you're a Bulgarian out there and you listen to this and yeah, you, you understand that there's learned helplessness around you and you know you're not one of them, always remember as well there has to be a higher percentage of people that will stay in that mindset because we need to have employees. We need to have people that aren't leading the company. We need to have people that are actually going to do the day-to-day. Let that be them, not you. Someone has to flip the burgers. Someone has to flip the fucking burgers and wash the car and do the, 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 do the, the dishes. Don't let that be you. And if you listen to this message, especially what you just said, look for people that are doing it, not for people that aren't doing it. Block out all of the noise. If there's any Bulgarians out there telling you you can't, this and the other, tune out of that podcast. T- zone out of that frequency. Look at the trailblazers. Be around good people. Go to networking events. I mean, there's so many th- people here that I, I mean, I'm only encountering the positive people that are all killing it because that's my frequency. Anything else, I don't hear it. I will block it. I will remove it. Then if that's all of your hearing, you can't help but, like you say, set your targets higher, higher, higher. You have no noise that's trying to pull you back down and allow those people to go and wash your car. Do your shit. Do your laundry. That's fine. But it doesn't have to be you. It's just reminding people of that all the time. And I know we can't win everyone over. And frankly, the, the system wouldn't work if we did. Hmm. And that's okay too. I, I respect immensely the people that are doing those jobs. But what I don't respect is people that do them and they're constantly unhappy and they're <laughs> complaining all the time, but they're not doing anything about it. That, that's the part that gets me. Because, I, I, I mean, again, someone has to do it. For example, I always give this example. Like the, the, the garbage collection company that goes in my, my area of living, I, there's this one specific garbage bus when, when you see how much fun the guys are having, you almost want to jump on the garbage <laughs> truck as well. And I respect the shit out of those guys because I'm, I'm sure as hell not going to unload those, you know, trash bins. Um, unless I have to because I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. But I respect those people. But they don't look like the types that complain all the time and they're like, oh, the country is not doing this and the government's this and why I'm not getting this, but he's getting that. that that's a part I can't stand because I know some people that do their job with excellence, even though it's mm-hmm. like an entry level job and they don't complain and they're doing a fantastic job and I respect them. This is what I said. Like if you are one of those people yeah. that are sitting here listening to this message saying, I'm not one of these people. I fucking hate where I'm yeah. at. Then we're here to help. Like message me on social media. I'll, like, I'll help anyone I can whenever I can. I want to see people do better. But my biggest hate, the same as you, is someone that sits there and complains that has no fucking desire to do it anything about it no matter what like those people are a curse to everyone else it's the most draining we call them mood hoovers right (laughs) because like i said there's an opportunity cost in everything in life there normally is a decision and at the very least if it's how you approach a situation that's your decision you can approach something positively or negatively you can approach it as a learning (laughs) learning curve or something that's detracting from you. There's almost an in and out in every single situation in life and you can choose which one you pick. And if you're always choosing to pick the one that's <laughs> negative, victim mindset. Afraid to take risks. Every, it's everything that's wrong about the human race. Hmm. That, that right there that you're describing is everything that's wrong. And they ruin it for everyone else as well because I'm a big believer of frequency and the frequency that you're around. So like a radio station, Mm. you tune into a channel. That's what you hear. And the trouble is if your frequency is low, you tune into the channel of those people. And it's very hard to tune yourself out of it because that's what you're being fed because the the information that's on that radio station is being fed into you day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. But it's your choice to switch that off. And you can actually do things in your life to change that. For example, if you look at your phone, how many people, if you look at your WhatsApp messages or your normal messages or your phone list if you look at everyone that's contacted you recently how many of those are mood hoovers how many of those people are actually moaning complaining trying to pull you down that's you if everyone else did the same thing 
I bet it's the majority of people on there. Block them. Doesn't matter if it's family, friends, don't care. Get them off your phone. Tune out to it. If you have to see them because they're family, see them on certain occasions. Don't make it <laughs> a daily thing to be tuning into their rubbish because it's not helping you at all. In fact, in fact it's actually detracting from you. If you it's think, also the, detracting from them in the future. Yes. Because if you get better, you can help them. Of course. So it's, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely cycle one way or the other. The things that you listen to, the podcasts you put on, the music you listen to, the, the, the YouTube conversations you listen to, if any, what are they about? What are they saying? Just switch on to things that are positive, that are growth orientated, where people are talking about wins rather than losses. People are talking about the, the things that they're, they're working towards and what they're striving towards and the way they approach certain situations and the frameworks they have. Show you what's possible. Turn off for anything else that isn't. It's very easy to suddenly change your environment to be way more productive and way more positive. That's very powerful. That's something you can do today. Yeah, back back in like even 30 years ago, your environment was pretty much who you grew up with. Mm -hmm. And now we have the possibility to create our own digital environment, which a lot of people don't take advantage of. Because we also had have um, a Discord community for a podcast. Amazing. People that follow us. Uh, and f funnily enough, when I saw the way you've structured things with Limitless Uni, we kind of starting to do the same thing, not in the same uh, niches, but kind of like the same thing. So I guess I see a lot of people starting to go that route in building, you know, uh, type of mentorship around their competencies. But our community is like super accessible. It's like 40 level. That's uh, 20 euros, like, I don't know, 15 pounds or whatever. Yeah. And the caliber of people inside sometimes amazes even myself. Like there's this kid, not going to say his age, but he made $100,000 last week in like three days of work because he's like a started young. He's like a smart mm -hmm. contracts auditor, found some bugs in whatever protocol. And th that's some, some part of the things that he's doing. We also have some people that, I don't know, they have factories that make a lot of money. Can't really say how much, but they're doing really, really well. And they're still in that community, you know, they, and sometimes they respond to, you know, me, whatever, to everyone. And you can learn from them. And there's like a ton of different communities like this. And the one thing, because I forgot to mention that earlier, the one thing that I always got from mentorship uh, is uh, good contacts if I put in the effort. Because even a crappy mentorship, if someone has sold, let's say, to a thousand people, let's say 15K ticket entry, like out of those, like imagine a, a thousand people that can afford to, to invest 15K. Like they must be doing well. Some of them might be, you know, a bit more arrogant. Some of them might not respond to you. Some of them might have zero clue what they're doing, but like a bunch of them would be really cool people to connect uh, with. Like one, one of the mentorships I was in, we were in as a team, like um, we didn't get that much out of it because maybe it was a bit too far ahead uh, of the curve for us. But I met this one guy who showed me this one thing that has to this day saved us, I don't know, $20,000 because he got me into a really good deal with Zapier and Zoom. Yeah. And I paid like, tw I still pay 20 bucks per month for Zapier for like 100,000 tasks. Well, okay. Yeah. And for Zoom, again, like 20 bucks per month and I get insane perks. That one's over, uh, un uh, unfortunately, but the Zapier <laughs> is still going, man. And mm. uh, and yeah, if, if just talk with people. Just talk with people and you get so much out of it. It's crazy. Quickly as well, I'm interested in this because I always have the discussion with uh, relationships and work. So has your relationship been that's another big thing that people put in hurdles in the way. It's like mm. having to find the right partner or you mm. know, I struggle with juggling both or I've got, you know, whatever, whatever excuse they have with their partner. What have you found to be like the formula for you and your balance with your wife and, and work? What's worked best for you guys? I think I just have the most amazing wife in the world. <laughs> That's, <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, yeah, we just, clicked on so many levels because we've we've known each other since high school but we, we got together way 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 later but 
everything is man in, in perfect symbiosis. It's like I, I don't think we have had a single argument ever. Maybe once or twice, maybe it's like two or three minutes. And the thing I say the most is like we both have a huge amount of respect and compassion and understanding of each other. And if I can say anything about, you know, work life balance, because um she would understand even if I say the next three months, you know, just I'm going to be locked up in a room and you're not going to see that mm -hmm. much of me. She understand that. I think that the most important thing that we do as a couple, as a family unit is I see with a lot of other people, ego gets in the way and they mostly argue about who's right and who's wrong, which is pointless because if you're faced with a problem, the only thing you should be arguing is what's the best way to solve the problem. And we've always been good at that. Like sometimes she's done something. I don't know I'm right, but it doesn't really matter. And sometimes it's the opposite. And we always focus on what's the task ahead. What do we need to do so we can get over it? Like close this page, open a new one. So I think that honestly, that's the only thing I can say. But uh, it's also the most important thing I can say, I feel like. I've always said about relationships. If you've got everyone else on the planet, to have arguments and go to war with, why on earth would you pick the person you live with to have an argument with or to disagree yeah, upon exactly. with? Because if anything, <laughs> you two working in symbiosis, like you said, and actually facing a problem together is fucking powerful. Where possible, always try and find a reason to agree with your partner, not always try and find a reason not to. How difficult would that change be? Because when you and someone, like a partner, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, are literally pushing together and in each other's corners, there is no better unity between humans. The power that can come from a couple is more powerful than I believe any other relationship that can be on the planet. So why aren't we actively seeking that? Everyone's so sabotaging of that. And like you say, that comes from ego from both parties, male and female, the, the need and desire to always be correct at the expense of not getting anywhere near as far ahead as you could be because if you're working together, the whole thing would be more pleasant and you'd build something amazing together, whether or not you're both directly doing it or one supporting the other. Also, you're not, you don't get anything out of being right. Just a bit of comfort but that's it. I heard a saying as well. The person that right is right. The person that's right in an argument is the person that didn't actually learn anything from that argument. Hmm. Okay. That's a really, that's true. really nice way of looking at it. Yeah. If you were right, then you already knew the answer. You didn't actually progress or improve. If you were wrong and you didn't know the answer, that's a good thing because now you do. You improved. So you actually won. How do you balance uh, life and work and your busy traveling schedule? Because obviously you're out here from time to time. You travel to other countries as well. And you said mm. your, your wife and your kids are in the UK. Yeah, so first and foremost, what I will say is a lot of people, because there'd be a lot of younger guys in here as well, going, I don't want to have to balance a girlfriend and work and this and the other. Guys, if you can't balance a girlfriend and work, then you won't ever balance a business because there's so many variables that you have coming your way that you just simply, if you can't manage that that relationship, then you won't be able to build a, a decent business because there's so many more things that come into play. Yes, that's a, big, a biggie, but boy, just get, get a nine to five, first and foremost. Secondly, with everything, is always trying to find a way to make it work rather than trying to find a way not to make it work. That's how I was looking. I'm like, okay, how can we make this work? Things are changing. My life changes every five minutes. I'm always in a different country. I'm always coming up with new, some new business idea. I've always, you know, massively pushing for expansion. I'm very, very, very aspirational in what I'm trying to achieve. That's what I am, and that's who I am, and my wife knows that when she married me. It's difficult because I'm always changing the goalposts and when we get settled, there's always something else that comes up. And yes, that's selfish, but it's my driver. It's what gets me out of bed. And I told her that when we got married, before we got married. So she wasn't unaware of that. But what I always try and do is I try and actually have an open conversation. And more than anything, I need to get, not necessarily always her approval on things, but I need her to get to understand why. 
I'm doing certain things. Because if you don't bring your partner into the conversation, if I don't bring my wife into the conversation, explain why I'm doing these things, she will take that as he's doing it because he wants to and it's not any benefit to her. She doesn't feel part of the journey. Same way as if you have staff members and you're independently making decisions about the company, even though it's your business, they don't feel part of it and therefore they don't feel any desire to want to be moving with you through this transitional period. So one big thing is as you're changing, as you're growing, make sure you have a proper conversation with your partner and understand why you think it's gonna benefit you as a whole more and what her role, if anything, is to play in that and how much support she's being to you and reminding her of the fact that you appreciate that beyond all, all other things. I think as a gentleman, that's the best thing you can do is just really reinforce and remind your partner, your wife, your girlfriend, just how much help they actually are to you. Same with staff, right? You can't do this without them. That for one will get rid of 90% of your problems with anything where it comes to arguments and anything else because all of a sudden, they don't feel like they're doing it in spite of you. Second to that, it's then actually logistically working stuff out. So I actually spend a lot of money making sure that we have as much support as humanly possible at home. So if I'm away, I made the conscious decision of like, if I can't be there to physically help, I'll have to replace my time with someone else's because that's fair. You know, if I'm being allowed to go away and build the business and earn more money, then if you're also doing the same because she works as well full time, we have to have something in place that replaces that time. That's fair. So we have a live-in nanny, which is the best investment I've ever made in my entire life. And people say that's like, oh, you sound like some asshole, this, that, and the other. Well, no, I only got that when I had the money to do it. But it's enabling me to be freer to actually build the business. So it's actually helping a lot more. So we have a live-in nanny. We have a family calendar. This was actually the best thing we ever did as a, as a family, right? So it got to a point where, you know, time is so restricted that everything had to be slotted in. But the problem came in that my wife has a busy calendar, I have a busy calendar. And of course, we both have to do things together. <laughs> so I'm booking stuff in my calendar, she's booking stuff in her calendar, and then we're trying to find space where we can do stuff together. It was, it was impossible. So I built, initially it was called FamCal, which is actually an app, which you actually put all the family so you can see everyone's calendar. We then transitioned into Google Calendar, so it all, all slotted in. I then got an executive assistant who has access to my wife's calendar, my calendar, our in-laws calendars, all of their contact details. And I allow one person at the top to book everything in, rather than independently, Hannah and I, my wife, booking stuff in ourselves. So it all goes through one communication channel. So that way, she and I never overbook anything together, because that's always a massive, massive source of arguments. I told you last Wednesday that we had that thing this Thursday. Really? Like, I must have been asleep to that conversation. Yeah, but I, you, you even agreed to me and you said how nice it's going to be. You know, you know those ones where you said, yeah, you've been nodding away and you've agreed to something. You've even had a cold conversation about the dress that she's going to wear and how beautiful she looks in it. And you remember nothing about it. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's got to be a better solution to this. So we have an assistant that books it all through. Or you don't have to have an assistant. You can even use AI for all this stuff now. But plan your schedule together so you both know what each other is doing. And it's not a shock that all of a sudden something came in that they weren't expecting. It's the unexpected stuff where you throw stuff in that they were wanted to do something with you and then realize they can't. Man, I think a lot of people were late to this. Like, <laughs> this is, I think, one of the most common issues. And like the easiest fix to it is just it's like a, a communal calendar. People get so funny about it because they're like, well, that's not romantic. I'm like, either's arguing. So I'd rather have like a diplomatic solution. And there's quite a lot of things you can apply from business into your, your, your private life to actually make things a lot smoother. I just want to spend quality time with my wife. I don't want to be sitting there arguing about the fact that I didn't remember that we had a, a friend's party on the weekend. I disagree. Like the action of scheduling it, 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 <laughs> in, it can't be romantic, but you know, you can plan for spontaneous stuff to make it romantic. Of so course. like they're two separate things. Of course. So we're not 18. I mean, come on. I'm formulaic. And I found that anything that we were having arguments about was always tracked back to something really fixable. There was nothing really meaningful. Mm. It was bickering about things that were very solvable. Because at the core, my wife and I are so compatible. Anything that we were disagreeing on was just basic utility based stuff, just day to day running of the family. That's fixable. That's a business problem. That's a logistics problem. We solved it. 
And now we have a very good relationship in that we actually spend quality time. And what we've done with the nanny as well is we don't ever want our children to feel like we've been replaced by a nanny. So the way we approach it is our nanny is child admin. So our nanny is there more than anything to like support us, make the food, get the bags ready, put the, get the clothes out ready for them. We put the kids to bed, we drop them off at school, we spend time with them after school. I make sure that one of us is always driving them to and from. You know, we, we read them their books, we take them to all the family events, but we are supported with the running day to day of all yeah. the admin stuff so that we get to spend the quality time with the kids. Because that's really smart. That's a smart way to do it. And that's we've found to be the best way. So we call it child admin, not nanny. Because otherwise people are just outsourcing. They're outsourcing, but then you have to remember that your kids are so impressionable at that age. Yeah. That whoever they're around and listening to for a prolonged period of time is they're going to be absorbing a tremendous amount from. And for me, I trust myself and I want my kids to have good morals and ethics. Yes, I want them to be independent, but I don't know a third party's moral and ethics like I know my own. And even if, if it's someone that's not within the family either, like my parents or my, my, my wife's parents, then I really don't know what they're gonna be teaching my kids or influencing my kids to be like. So that way we have the help, but we don't necessarily have the issues that underlie a lot of people that bring kids up with a nanny and then I wonder why they have completely different visions and out views on life. And that's worked really brilliantly well for us. Another question that popped in my mind earlier, and I wanted to talk about it, was because um, it, it's kind of similar. Uh, is do you have partners in your businesses, and how are you able to make them fully functional, and you know just do the maintenance work in in, in them? So partners, I stopped after I got screwed over by one of my partners, and then I've since gone back to having partners. I realized that partners, once again, could be a great thing, but once, with everything, I took full accountability for every issue and fuck up that I've had. Like, yes, I got screwed over by my partner, but could I have avoided it? Yes, could I have had contracts? Yes, could I have been checking the bank balances? But better, yes. Could I put things in place to stop that from happening? Yes, I could put legal things in. Everything could have been done differently. And I realized it was no fault of the partner, it was fault of me, because I allowed those negative things to happen. Now, to your question, when you talk about like, how do I get them to function? What yeah, do you so mean exactly? The, you mentioned that your your businesses are fully functional without yes. you inside them. So the operations and like the leadership and everything is uh, is settled, yep. like it's taken care of. And do you do that through partnerships or just high professional management? And so with partnerships, typically that will be more of a a, a dual approach. And, and I partner with people that. For example, if we're going into businesses and ter territories that I'm not so familiar with, it, it suits me better to partner up or go into business with someone that understands that culture and that business better than I do because I don't necessarily understand it. So once again, I'll refrain from investing in there unless I have someone that has a financial incentive to make sure that thing works. <laughs> so for example, if you're getting investment from advice from someone, make sure that person's also got a shitload of money in that thing as well. That would be my prerequisite to actually make that investment. And it's the same with partnering up. So if I'm gonna launch in Bulgaria, Romania, et cetera, where possible, I'll probably partner with someone, and I have partnered with people that have a vested interest in that place, but also understand it way better than I do. Um, but in terms of actually building out something to be operational, definitely where possible, internal. So partnerships are great, where they bring something like that to the table, but on the whole, I'd rather do it independently and build out a great team below me. So I find that when there's, a, I found that when there's a split decision at the top, quite often, especially with my personality type, it can actually damage the culture of the business quite a lot because you've got two different people. Whereas I try to build the businesses correctly or wrongly. We might have a podcast in 10 years. I might tell you this is the biggest mistake of my life where I initially build it around employing people that buy into my vision and what my culture is about because then I can lead them. When I have someone else that's got equal uh, equity or equal power, I should say, in the business, they also have an equal distribution of their culture. If it's not slightly aligned with you, that can create divide within the business that I've found. So unless you find someone that's very in line with you, that, that, that can happen. But I find it easier to me build a business, put chief executive officers in place, management, systems, teams, hiring, and... Um, 
my management technique is very different from just incentivizing via money. Um, that's very. I don't easy. think that works for long. It does. You need to have both. Yeah. So this is one thing you need to have both. I've learned from the, I've learned the mistakes of of, of both. Um, you need to have a tremendous amount of financial incentive, but also there needs to be an element of fulfillment. And this is different from every single member of staff that actually is in within the business. So if we're going into a bit more of a technical business talk, it depends on the department of the, the company as well. So if your creative team will probably be more independently tr uh, driven by the actual growth and the development of the company. Quite often they need some sort of growth related share or bonus that's associated with that um, which I normally try and implement so they actually initially have that drive and motivation like you said that does fleet after time it erodes and then you want to be backing that up with if the companies are certain numbers and you're implementing like particular things that keep the company moving forward while I'm not here then you're going to get incentivized for that so one major component to every business that I grow is I make it answer two questions number one can my business run without me Right, so can I leave for three or four months, go away and have my business maintain the level that it's at while I'm away? So I build it for that. The second one, the most important one is, can my business grow without me? Can I go away for six months, come back and I have more money in the bank account than when we left? The business is a, the clients are happier, the, the business has moved forward in terms of its evolution, its fulfillment and everything else that's in it. Now, if you optimize for those things, whether or not you're going to sell it, you'll have incredible businesses. So if I, every decision I make, I tap back to those two questions. I'm like, is this decision good for that? Is it decision good for that? Is it incentivizing these things to happen? And when you optimize for those two questions, you actually build an incredible business, one that's also saleable because it's able to pull you out of it and actually be saleable to another business. That's where most businesses it has can't an sell. enterprise value. Becomes enterprisable, yes, as yeah. an enterprise value. Um, well, back to the original point. So that's the way I think about it. And I put COOs in place, creative teams in place, marketing teams in place. Sales team, I normally try and only hire people that are really money orientated. I think for sales- Sales and acquisition, the, the churn thing, rate yeah. is so high, there is very little fulfillment in it unless someone's genetically pre-wired to yeah. love money. That's the best fulfillment you can get in a sales role is commission-based sales and get people, animals on the phone and in the setting and on the emails that like to earn money and make sure that you earn them a lot of money and you'll keep a very good sales team and also offer products that, make, that, that really do pay well. They have to get good commission um, and that's, that's important. So in that area, I'm very much that attitude. Me trying to drive them and sell them on the mission is, is kind of pointless when they're having to do 3,000 DMs a day and multiple phone calls and everything else. It's hard work. Yeah, the vision just melts, man. <laughs> Real fast. <laughs> when you hear like 10,000 no's in a day, I mean, it's like, fuck your vision. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty <legit>. much. <laughs> yeah, we found the same for sales positions, although we, we, we mainly do the sales ourselves. Too. Yeah, that's because you're in line with both. So that, that works really well. And then with, with other departments, yeah, it's just, is this, are they going to help run? And then what you do really need is a very powerful A team at the top of any business. Um, so if you don't have a partner, which is what someone you can lean on for like that, you normally need a COO or somebody that's in an operational role that is like your right-hand man or woman, basically, that's going to be someone you can trust to make similar decisions to you had you not been there. That's the way I always think about it. Could I leave this person in charge and know that nine times out of ten, the decision that they made would be similar to me? Yeah. That's important. Really important. Um, and trying to find one of those is very difficult. Have you heard of the Mr. Beast method of doing this? I haven't, no. Yeah, he just says he does copies of himself. <laughs> himself. <laughs> right, okay. And when he hires someone, he requires them to live with him for six months <laughs> and shadow sense. him 24-7 and listen to him until they start thinking exactly the way he thinks. So this is what I do. I mentor my staff. Yeah. So I don't really, I have, I mentor a few people one-to-one, -one, a few very specific clients and they're, they're very big clients of mine. But more than anything, what my main focus is making sure that I mentor my staff. So that my COO, like you say, very similar method to that. I don't have them come live with me. I don't think they'd, they'd stick up with me for that long. But um, I don't think Mr. Beast has any family, does he? Or whatever. I no, think my, no, I think my wife might, might have a problem with a couple of guys in no, the bed with us. his method is like extreme, but Yeah, uh, I think my wife, my wife might have a couple, an issue with a couple yeah. of guys in bed with us and, and like people living around the house all the time. She puts up with a lot, but I don't think I'd be able to push that far. <laughs> 
So I, I basically book in calls where I mentor them. I let them come to the, I, I try and bring them to the house as much as possible. My house where we do work during the day, I'll, I'll let them sit on with client calls and I'll record, Zoom's brilliant for this as well. If you want to mentor people with how you act and, and interact with clients, just record everything. We do all of our Zoom calls document everything and then i put it on a g drive and then i i put different folders so we have i call it game footage where there might be client fulfillment sales wins like everything and then that way we have everything as and use that as training material or mentorship material so that people want to get to know our culture and how we do things can simply go away and watch what we're actually doing which is absolutely brilliant so that's what i i, I try and implement from the top down and then if you train someone that a team at the top to do the same thing you can then build levels of hierarchy that were stemmed from the way you had the vision and everything from yourself at the top. This is where it str I struggle to do this with partners quite as much because it then divides a little bit on how you both do things and if they're copying it, it doesn't necessarily just copy over with that model. Yeah, I agree on that then. I mean, partnerships obviously have their benefits, but oh, yeah. this, is th like, this is the hard part because you can't really tell your partner what to do. Not really. I mean, you can try to convince them, but you can't really command them. And sometimes um, that's the, the issue with being too democratic. There's certain periods in, in, in life and in business where democracies are just too slow. I also think as well in a partnership, one thing you should look for is probably a more uh, dominant partner in that there's normally someone that's probably slightly better and more trusted to make bigger decisions in that partnership. Um, and I find that normally to be the case. If there's two of you that both have very, very strong beliefs that aren't normally in a line, which is, you probably shouldn't go into partnership with someone like that yeah. anyway, um, but you will typically find that someone is better and faster and more trusting at making decisions. And that normally just naturally occurs within two people anyway. Um, but if you're finding that two of you are quite hot-headed and that you do get to points where things are disagreed upon, then I've actually done this to be honest with you, where we've put contracts in place in certain businesses in, we've spe I've specified with a business partner of mine, I can't say who it is, this is actually in the Middle East, it's in Dubai, one of our companies, that we were quite new together in terms of working with one another and we wrote out an initial working contract that basically said if some, neither of us agreed on a particular decision that was being made about whatever topic, we would then identify what area of expertise that fell under. If it was tech, it'd be dealt with, the final decision would be made by that guy. If it was fulfillment and marketing related, it would fall on my side. So we made a clear defini a definitive uh, line contractually to say that if we both make a disagreement on a specific subject, the decision would be made dependent on the skill of that thing or the area in which it fell in. and that person who had the best knowledge in that thing would ultimately be the decision maker. And we both signed off on that, which was actually quite an eloquent way of doing it because that would be the only way. We never had disagreed on anything anyway, but we just put that in place just in case. So we had like clear terms defined about disagreements. Yeah, and I imagine people listening are like, well, isn't it like this in every <laughs> partnership? And the answer is no. <laughs> Even though it sounds logical, people still try to, to make all How many people decisions? actually have business contracts with their partners? I, I mean, it'll baffle you how few many... Look, when you've been stung enough time by people, I have contracts for everything. I have a lawyer on retainer in three different countries because the obviously the, the legal requirements of the different countries change because that's the one big thing that can take you down. Litigation. Legal. Why put all of this effort in and leave a whopping great hole in your armor? Like, you've done everything else. Just make sure you're covered. And something as simple as a contract with your client, with your partner, whoever, can save literally bankruptcy. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. I've had it done to myself. Simple contracts. And you can map all this stuff out before. And this is where mentorship can come in because I can sit with someone and be like, hey, buddy, have you got a contract for that? They'll be like, no. I'll be like, I've just saved you potential bankruptcy and divorce 10 years down the line. <laughs> like they don't realize how much value that brings because I've done it and I've seen it. I've got friends that have been through it. I've had divorces over it, not from the actual con like lack of contract with the, the wife, but the fact that business has gone under, it's put so much stress on their family yeah. that it ends the up ruining off, them. Yeah. It ruins them. Just because they don't have a simple contract made. Mad. 
That's true. I, I don't have a contract with my partners. <laughs> when we started, we didn't, if, well, we were so new to business. We didn't know that that was necessary, but we've worked for nine years, close to 10 years now. Wow. Close to 10 years together. And we've had so many occasions to screw each other over. But not only that we didn't, we were actively covering our backs when someone had an issue, the other one would back them up. That I mean, now, now it's, there's like a brotherly bond between us. Uh, but but uh, for new partners, we definitely um, have at least like a small document, which is not as, let's say, substantial as what you mentioned, which is probably smart to do in the future. We did that because of the level yeah. of the business we were talking about. Yeah. We were both going into an eight-figure business, which for, for everyone out there is like over 10 million a year straight yeah. away. And we both had independent lawyers working on the contract. Yeah. So we had our lawyers writing and arguing with each other where he and I were sitting there going, this is crazy, right? And he's going, yeah. They're like, we just want to get going. It was like, we would just be happy to get going. But we knew that the consequences of something going wrong would be catastrophic. Yeah. So everything had to be layered out. Everything had to be sorted. We spent a lot of money on litigation and had the lawyers argue until we got to a point where we sat down and made an agreement on the contract. So what lawyers will always do is my lawyer will always try and make the best contract possible for me while his contract is always trying to get the best possible contract for him. Yeah. So it's then trying to find a middle ground where they both go extreme ends, whereas like it's just completely unfair. And then they both argue back and forth to where there's a middle ground met and compromises are made where you tick it off. Hopefully you never have to use them or pull them up, but it's nice to have them there. What my experience is, and obviously it's not that uh, great as yours, but it's that in the process of drafting the document and you, first of all you get clear on your responsibilities mm -hmm. but second of all just having like a one page where even if you're yourselves with your partners you just write down i'm going to be doing this and this this is my purview this is your purview just sign it off it helps so much because two years down the line like you thought that you agreed on something and then it's something else and then th it's this big issue but when you have the document just like look it's in writing like you agreed to this are we going to do this or not it helps so much and even if you manage to get the partnership going it just saves a lot of time and energy it save a lot of marriages as well if people did this at home <laughs> right probably did yeah. you think of it so every single thing in my business like we have clearly defined roles that's how we say it right? every job task has clearly defined roles everyone in the team has clearly defined roles so at home the only time arguments really emerge especially with my wife and everything else until we actually had these conversations Whose job is it to do the dishes? Who's putting the trash out? Who's doing the bed sheets? I know it sounds stupid, but how many times have people sat down with their partner and gone, I've done the bed sheets the last five times, you haven't done it, and then it's built into something way bigger yeah. than it needed to be? Well, if we just define that you do it on a Monday, I do it on a Wednesday, you do it on a Friday, as stupid as it sounds, there'd be no arguments. Because it's clearly written out and said, right, that's what you're doing. We do the dishes on this day, you cook on this day, da -da. fine. I bet the level of arguments and level of divorces is probably half. <laughs> yeah. If you literally just had clearly defined roles in your marriage. But that also requires what we talked about, which is not having the ego. Yes. Because then you just, uh, what I see people doing when they go into this is try to dump everything on the other person because they overly inflate what uh, the value of what they're doing. So my wife and I, this is what we did. We sat down and said, right, you're working flat out. I'm working flat out. What do you agree to do? She went, I'm not doing any of that. I said, either am I. I said, well, if that's the case, then we need to hire someone to do it, don't we? Yep, okay, tomorrow we look for someone. Simple as that. Yeah. Because it was becoming a major problem and nothing was getting done. That, that's the easiest solution. But again, to do that, you need money. You do need money. Yeah. So there has to be that, that, that element. And the thing is, if you, have, you are in a role where two people aren't willing to make money or do any of the, the household, maybe you're the wrong partner. And to be honest, if that's the case, what you just described, you need to first look into yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. First, first of all, is yeah. always look at yourself. Why, why are you not willing to do one of those things? Yeah. So in your, I'm going to shift back to <laughs> a bit to, to the business stuff. Although that was, that was, that was awesome. Like, um, I don't see a lot of people nowadays talking about marriages and the family unit. Yeah. And um, I, for one, totally enjoy being married. But um, yeah, with, with, your, with your mentorship right now, how many students do you have? Because I'm always curious about numbers. So we're shy of the thousand mark. 
of like high ticket mentees. That's a lot. I couldn't give you the exact amount on communities. Yeah. It'd be quite a bit higher. Um, but we're able to be at that capacity because we've got different mentors in different spaces. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, the maximum you could have a high ticket per person, I won't allow it. So I cap it now. So I won't allow a mentor to have more than 20 people that they're mentoring at any one time because it's one-to-one. -one. I only ever want them doing 10 Zoom calls per week. So we do bi-weekly Zoom calls, for example, in most of the, the systems because they need to have the time and attention to put into the mentee. And also another prerequisite as well that I make the mentors have is that their, ment their, their, their business is actually bigger than the money that they earn from the mentorship. I don't want the mentor, because there's so many mentors online now that are just mentors and they don't actually have a business that they're trying to promote that they they they, they say. Mm. So you've got so many people that, for example, you have crypto traders and coaches and all these people. Talk about how much money they're making on crypto. They're not really. They're making all their money from selling their service. We're actually not really doing the thing that they're saying they're doing. And they're really disingenuine with that. So what I always wanted was, for one, for the, the mentors to keep their finger on the pulse with the industry. Secondly, so for example, all of our e-com guys have still got massive stores that they're running and they're still mentoring on the side so that they can always be talking from a place of experience. Same with me, I'm running my businesses. So when I mentor a business, I can talk about the things that I'm going through and the things that I'm doing right now and give you my advice versus regurgitating stuff that I may have done a while back or I've never done. And that's how we've managed to keep the service level so high and ultimately stay relevant and give value on a consistent basis by ensuring the incentive structure of the mentors is that their main business is their bread and butter. Yeah, that's that's a cool way to go about it. And w which businesses do you mentor? Which businesses do I mentor personally? Yeah. Or as the as Limitless? As, as No, as, as yourself, because you mentioned that you have a, a couple of big clients, but I assumed from just what you said that you still mentor some of the ones in Limitless. Yes, so all of the mentors in Limitless, I try to mentor. <laughs> There's probably a few too many now, but ones especially that are newer until the, 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 some of the older mentors, they've, they've been with me for, for years. They, they understand the vision. They're mm. part of the furniture. They're amazing. My team is incredible. Um, so I mentor the mentors, which is a big thing. And then a lot of the mentors that I have were people that I mentored anyway, pretty much all of them. So as you said, actually, Mr. B says people come live with him for six months. I normally mentor someone for a good six to 12 months before I even decide whether or not I think they should be offered the opportunity to come mentor for us. I see their work ethic. I see how successful they've been. I get the best, it's the best mentoring training you could possibly have is for me to mentor them. They also learn how I do things, my approach. Mm. Everything has been built into them. I'm like, okay, do you also want to do this and help other people do what you've just done? Plus, they can use themselves as a testimonial for sales. I started at this point. I worked with Elliot and Limitless to get to this point, And now look where I'm at. Now I'm also doing this. This is my business. This is how I do it. I can show you to do the same thing. So they're relatable also. There's so many benefits to that. But, I mean, I work with anyone. For me personally, at the moment, I've got people in the artwork space. I've got people in... Um, I say people, a person in the artwork space has got a, like a crazy, crazy business um, doing artwork reproductions for billionaires. Mad space. Like I've, you've never heard anything like it. Um, basically, they do replicas of, of people that normally own the art but then want mm. duplicates for their yachts and other things. And oh, It's mad. That's that's crazy. Obviously, the marketing behind that is extremely difficult because it's all private. I do work with one of the biggest recruitment companies in the UK. Um handle help them with the marketing and, and mentoring that and also a lot of emotional and relationship advice as well you'd be surprised to know with a lot of coos and owners of these companies i've got people that are running other mentorships as well because for me i want to help the education space become as good as humanly possible to my mind there's so much to feast on out there that if we're too narrow-minded we don't want to help other people that are in the same space as us we're only hindering ourselves so if someone comes to me and they're in the same field as me, yeah, of course I'll help you. I'll open up my book. I'm not threatened by that. And if someone does actually come out of the woodwork and I mentor them and they become better than me, then what the hell was I doing? That's on me. <laughs> I want to be part of the community and I want to help people. So what I'm trying to do is if I actually work with anyone in particular, it's something that intrigues me and interests me. So I also get to learn while I'm doing it. I want to focus on my businesses primarily, but this is my little like crutch 
Whereas it's not necessarily optimal for the business growth of me and my businesses. But you know, I said to you before, it's about optimizing for happiness as well. I love working with different people. I love learning new things. I love getting into industries. The art world I'm now learning about. The recruitment world I'm learning about at a way bigger level because it's an, a big nine-figure company that I'm involved with. It's enormous. I'm learning how systems and structures work for that, which I can now apply to my business as I build it out because I don't know how to run a nine-figure company. I don't own one. I'm not doing over 100 million in any one of my companies which I will do at some point, so I need to know how it works. So not only am I mentoring them in certain aspects of the business, I'm also learning how he's built that company to that point and how he, how he handled it. So I'm getting, I'm getting value both ways there, which is fucking brilliant from my perspective. And I mean, that's the best way, isn't it? Yeah. A win-win. It's a win-win. And I've been open a bit to him about that. He's like, fine. Like, I'm asking him loads of questions as well, but I'm providing him a ton of value in his sales and marketing department because we're basically digitalizing, digitalizing a lot of the stuff that he's doing is a bit archaic um so i i really like the idea of working with businesses that okay let me let me start this again i've become a very good bridge in that because of the age that i am and the place i am in my life right now in terms of what i've achieved i'm getting respect from the older business owners that have been and done it they might be 60 70 years old still have amazing businesses and haven't got any intention of retiring anytime soon but I've also learned the new ways of marketing because I was slightly, I was young enough to be part of that. And I'm sat right in the middle where- You're like the middle child. A 55, 60 year old businessman will sit there and look at a 18 year old YouTuber trying to tell him how to market his business and go, buddy, what do you know? Go away and have no, no respect for him. Although that YouTuber might have the best skill set ever, he's not getting the instant respect from someone of that age because he simply doesn't, from that person's perspective, doesn't understand it and also won't want to listen to someone of that age. Whereas I'm 33 next week, I think it is, with two kids, successful businesses under my belt. I've been through a lot of trials and tribulations. I've proved that I can accumulate wealth and keep wealth for a prolonged period of time, which is really desirable for someone that's older in business because they understand that that in itself is a massive skill. Someone that can create wealth and keep it is a very, very big skill to, to learn. So then they will actually sit at the table with me and ask me questions and listen. And I'll probably give them very similar advice to that 18 year old kid about how they need to market their company, but they're listening to me. And I'm able to put it in a way because I also come from their world. I used to have brochures, I used to have the floppy disk, I used to have all the stuff I used to go, I understood the, the way they built their business so I can empathize with them. And I can, I can deliver it to them in a way that actually gets them to understand why they need to do it. And therefore, I'm working with a lot of big businesses now that are huge, but know if they carry on the way they are in the next 10 years, they won't exist anymore because the little guys that are coming up wipe them out. And I'm helping them change over. And I'm loving that. I'm loving working with those bigger businesses that have now realized that they need that, they need that change. And that's very fulfilling too. And going in and helping the whole infrastructure and systems change and staffing and mindset change. It's very interesting working with a 60-year-old guy that's fully set in his ways and having a bit of a, it's a battle where I have to really use my social skills and influence to make him think that he's come up with the idea himself to actually buy into the idea. It's mental chess, I love it. Because I know it's best, the best thing for his business, but I have to really figure out how to play it with someone like that who does have ego, that has a whole life of success and who's sitting there going, what do you know? And I have to work on convincing him that this is the, the way to do it. And yes, you have been very successful, but that won't continue. And then get him to come up with a, an acceptance of that quite often by making him think that he came up with the idea and having no ego in that, which is quite an interesting one. I love, I love that game. I think it's fun. Yeah, that, that sounds fun. Um, you know, those guys, as set as they are in their ways, man, the experience oh. they have, and like the stories and you know the wisdom like pure wisdom uh flowing out of them because you have the information you maybe have you know some knowledge areas but like the, the wisdom on that that, that they have uh, from that much um you know time in the arena is is insane where possible always hang around and speak to people that are much older than you are whether or not it's for business advice or not wisdom is unbelievably powerful and I think just having a good source of 
wisdom in your environment is very, very important. A lot of people forget about that because I'm I'm victim of that actually. I always like to have a young team, really energetic, really entrepreneurial, very ambitious. But sometimes it is very, very, very important to have someone that's been there and done it that has actually made a lot of the mistakes because the fundamentals are always the same. Yeah, the technology might have changed, but the way the world work and the way the, the natural order of things work hasn't. And they quite often give a really nice perspective on things because as Hormozy puts it, like your 80 year old self will see things quite often very differently to how you do in the day. And as I also alluded to earlier, this thing is a journey, it's not a destination. And you should be optimizing for happiness across the entirety of the journey, not sacrificing everything now for maybe a little bit of happiness later in life and then having a massive regret. So having some of that wisdom is just nice. And then also these people can actually be really eye-opening because they see things from a different angle to you. So when you combine their thoughts with what you know and come from it from two different angles, you quite often get something that's completely magical. So always be open to listening. I love conversations with people that are older and wiser than me. That's a, it's a very powerful way to be. I think that's also a, a great way to end the podcast. And uh, I think really wise words. Before we, we let you go, um, where can people find you? And do you have like a certain message you want to uh, get across? So I actually now have a team of, of uh, crazy Bulgarians that are creating different Bulgarian accounts for me. So we're trying to <laughs> use AI to, to translate and uh, we're using, even dubbing some of my voice so people, can, even if they can't understand English, uh, be able to watch some of me. So TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, just put Elliot Wise and I'll come up on all of those. You can message me as well. Anyone that's uh, wanting to, to ask me any questions or you want to get out of the nine to five or you just don't know where to start, please just give me a message. I'll do my best to help. Um, and anyone else that wants to meet me in Bulgaria, I'm always trying to be available. I'm trying to build my network here. I'm new here. I'm loving it. I'm loving the people. It's been amazing. One of the best experiences and one of the best places I've ever been to. That's why I bought a place here and I bring my family here. I want my kids to experience the culture. And it's incredible. And I think if there's one message that I can give is that you are living in one of the best countries that I've ever visited in the world. And I have all the opportunities to live wherever I want on this planet, literally anywhere. I'm privileged enough to, to be able to do that. I've looked at multiple places. I've looked at Dubai. I've looked at other places in the Middle East. I've looked at Australia. I've looked at America. I'm coming to Bulgaria as my second place of home because I see the opportunity here. I see what you guys have. I feel the fire, I feel the hunger, and I see that I wanna be part of this change and I wanna be influential in helping people in this, 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 this huge opportunity that's about to expose itself. It's gonna get so fun and exciting here. And like I said, you can be one of those people that sit here after this podcast and say, well, Elliot, you're an asshole. I don't agree with you. You had all these opportunities. Or you can have a chat with yourself and be like, well, actually maybe he is right. Maybe there is something I can do. There's podcasts like this. You've got groups, Discord channels. We've got mentorships like myself. There's no excuse anymore why you guys can't have the best life and go into this period and be one of the people that when your grandkids are older and say, granddad, I'm so happy that you did that thing and you took advantage of that opportunity. Or you can be that granddad that sits there going, why the hell weren't you one of the guys that's now got all this, all this wealth and is one of the best guys in Bulgaria and, and, and took advantage of that time? I don't understand it. Hindsight's a really horrible thing if you're on the wrong side of it. And that's a decision you can make today. Choice is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Pleasure, I man. I guess we'll record another podcast uh, sometime in the future. I'd, I'd uh, love to. I really enjoyed this one. And uh, I'll leave all the links below in the description so you can follow Elliot everywhere. And we'll talk to you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.